Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back for the second session of today's conference. Uh, my name is Katinka Evers. I'm a professor of philosophy from uh, Uppsala University in Sweden, and I have the pleasure of chairing the second session of today. So I would like, first of all, to thank the organizers for having invited me to this conference, which is extremely interesting, and it's a pleasure to be here. Now, uh, as I'm sure that the first session made eminently clear, the human brain's neuronal development is comparatively long um, compared to other animals. The human brain maturation takes place during the course of an approximately 15-year-long period um, following birth, uh, during which, and to some extent after which, it is subject to cultural influences, both on the individual level and uh, on the social group level across generations. During this relatively long postnatal period of human brain maturation, when the brain develops in relationship with the environment, um, critical and reciprocal relationships take place between the brain and its physical, social, and cultural environments. This period, we may say, sets the stage for the full-grown individual's cognitive capacities. It may herald future health or disorders and decline. Cognitive disorders uh, significantly impair the cognitive capabilities of the individual to the point where normal functioning in society becomes impossible without treatment. There is a variety of different kinds, notably dementia, developmental disorders, motor skill disorders, amnesia, or substance-induced cognitive impairment. Like most uh, mental disorders, there is also a variety of causes. They include hormonal imbalances, genetic predisposition, and environmental factors, and here we are specifically back to the infant, when lack of proper nutrients and interaction during vulnerable stages um, of cognitive development um, uh, may cause very serious impairments. There is also substance abuse or physical injury. But I think the most important um, in this context is that the absence of adequate stimulation, especially in the infant, will cause irreversible damage um, to the cerebral network. Our knowledge about the brain has grown enormously in recent decades. But the knowledge we have and the abundance of data we have remains comparatively fragmented. <coughs> We still lack an integrated view on the brain as a whole function, and we also lack an integrated understanding of the brain and the subjective reality to which it gives rise, namely consciousness. Now, we are hoping that um, uh, the different neuroscience and, and ICT projects that have seen the light of day in recent years, one of the most important ones being the Human Brain Project, may help us um, accelerate the progress towards a multi-level understanding of the human brain, a better diagnosis and treatment of brain diseases, and brain-inspired information and communications technology. However, I think that what we need to be aware of is that knowledge of the anatomy and physiology of the human brain is insufficient if we are wanting to understand and really help the situation from people who suffer from cognitive disorders or mental disorders. The subjective perspective is also extremely uh, important to understand. The patient perspective. Um, one illustration uh, that I will give is that the cognitive decline and the cognitive disorder from which a person suffers is often accompanied by strong emotional disturbances. It can be very anxiety-provoking, frightening, and gen generally worrisome as a condition. Now, the fear and the worry that the patient may experience depends in part on the insight that he or she may have into the condition. 
And now for a long time, uh, the possibility of uh, having insight uh, in, for example, the development of frontotemporal dementia was contested. It was a core criterion of the disease that um, the patient had a, an absence of insight. There was a loss of insight. However, uh, in a study in 2007 that I conducted together with neuropsychologists at Uppsala University, we found that close to 40% of the patients did have determinate insight into their condition. Uh, the group of patients was small, but still, in view of the fact that we were contesting a core condition, the results were statistically significant. Now, the point being, not only uh, that there is a diagnostic relevant uh, factor here, but also that understanding that the patient might have insight will or should affect the way that the caregivers treat and relate to the patient in clinical contexts. Another very dramatic uh, discovery in recent years concerns the detection of residual awareness, residual consciousness, amongst patients who suffer from consciousness disorders, such as coma or vegetative states. The use of neurotechnology has managed, has given rise to the possibility of detecting that there is, in fact, some residual awareness in some of these patients, not many, very far from the majority of them, but some of them. So now the great challenge amongst many is to assess this consciousness, assess the subjective awareness of these patients, how do they feel, what do they feel, and a very big challenge here concerns the variability that we have between different brains. Because even within healthy brains, the variability is enormous, to the point that we may wonder how we communicate at all. We do communicate. I would suspect that we communicate far less than we think we do, but we do. However, in the case of a damaged brain, the problems of communications and the problem of understanding the subjective point of view is arguably increased. Um, so my point being that it's extremely important when we try to understand cognitive capabilities, cognitive development and cognitive decline, is to understand the necessity of developing both an integrated um, overarching view of the brain and brain functions and an understanding from the introspective subjective point of view, a challenge that is increased when we are talking about people who have damaged brains and live in that sense in an alternative or alternate reality. Now against this very brief and very general background, I am delighted to present the three topics of uh, today's second session. Professor Vishwa Dixit, uh, Deep Dixit, will discuss the role of innate immune sensors in regulating age-related inflammation and cognitive decline, and dietary metabolites that regulate the inflammasome. Professor Rudolf Tansi will describe what genetics teaches us about the etiology of Alzheimer's disease and brain aging. And our first speaker, Professor Richard Frakowiak will analyze how classification of disease might evolve in the age of informatics and what impact this could have on dementia diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. So I'm pleased to ask Richard to take the stage. Thank you very much. Hello there. Yes. Um, so you, you all had some cream. We are double cream, I hope. So I'm going to try and stay awake longer than you as, uh, <laughs> as you digest that um, and talk to you about um, the medical informatics platform that is one third, briefly known as Future Medicine, of the Human Brain Project. So this is a, a, a sort of um, response to Michael's stated Americocentric view of the world, as the European Brain Project is the first big brain project and is therefore a Eurocentric view of the world. 
Michael, you, you still love me, don't you? Yes. Um, I think there are a number of motives or motivations, and, and most of them are very clear to you. The first is that our populations are aging, that as you get to the age of 80, one in five of you will become dependent on somebody because of your cognitive decline. Uh, what's not so well known is that psychiatric disease is disease of the young, is a fatal disease sometimes, suicide or even homicide, and is also a disease that takes people out of active economic life, probably for their lifetime. So as we think about the generation of our children and our grandchildren, who in our European social democracies pay for our care when we're ill, pay for our pensions when we retire, we have to realize that there is an economic tsunami coming along much greater than HIV. And one of the problems uh, with all of this is that we're coming up against an intellectual brick wall. Not only an intellectual one, but also a medical brick wall. I have practiced neurology for 40 years. I retired three months ago. And at the end of that time, I've seen great things happen. Usually when the causes were known, not always, in multiple sclerosis, we still don't know the causes, but we don't bring patients into hospital for six months, keep them there while they have their bed sores treated, turn them into Cushingoid individuals, and throw them out again after nature has taken its course and they've recovered naturally. We now treat them as outpatients and we have active treatments which are symptomatic and useful. The problem is that with dementia, that is not the case. With dementia, there are a number of issues. The first of this, that you can be demented and still very powerful. <laughs> now, I'm using, I'm using technical terms here, so please don't get excited. Um, for example, if you just read some of the latest speeches, if you uh, listen to what his wife said subsequently and so on, in the second term, uh, Ronald Reagan, a very powerful figure who brought about great change in the world, was when giving speeches, talking off the point, using neologisms, being agrammatic. And uh, when he left office, uh, he pretty much went into very rapid decline simply because he had been so well supported. Now, this simply brings across the fact that with adequate support, cognitive decline can be hidden or helped. Uh, with some of these diseases, the veneer of social grace can remain for much longer than cognitive function remains. So what do we know about this? What causes Alzheimer's disease? Please just remember Alzheimer's disease is one of probably 15 plus causes of dementia, of which most are in old age. We often get our nomenclature mixed up. And many people talk about Alzheimer's as though there's the whole field of dementia. What are the mechanisms? What are the role of genes other than in the 10% where there is an association without a causative mechanism? What's the role of abnormal proteins, tombstones, or causes? Why do people get amyloid and no cognitive decline? Why do people with cognitive decline in aging not have amyloid? Why did we concentrate on abnormalities of neurotransmission, particularly in relation to acetylcholine? I mean, I'm an irreverent sort of guy, as you've noticed. I will tell you why we have concentrated very great resources on amyloid. It's because the first time we come into the pathological laboratory at university, we get a slice of brain and a little bit of Congo red, and we pour it over and we wash it off, and you don't even need to have a microscope to see the amyloid. It's easy done, so it's easy followed. Acetylcholine is slightly more complex. My uh, cynical uh, conclusions are that L-DOPA treated Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease responded to it and seemed to be a monoaminergic, unimonoaminergic disorder. When we found 
the absence of certain pyramidal cells in the substantia nominata, and they were cholinergic cells, we made a little metaphorical jump. These are now the drugs which are the most expensive placebos that we have. Not according to me, according to NICE, which, as you know, is the regulatory agency in the United Kingdom. So it may be biased. I don't know. So we have major, major problems. How do we prevent and treat? Well, can we diagnose it? The answer is we're not very good at that. The latest um, surveys of the American pathological clinical literature suggests that if we talk about Alzheimer's disease and we take as the gold standard the presence of neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid in the relevant parts of the hippocampus, we make a 30 to 40% error in the best hospitals with a five-day stay. Actually, normals are probably 30 to 40% Alzheimer's after the age of 80. It's just that they've compensated. You know that in Parkinson's disease, you need to lose 70% of the monaminergic nigrostriatal neurons, of which are about 300,000 on each side, an infinitesimally small number compared to the total number of neurons, before you get the first symptoms. The first symptoms. So in Alzheimer's disease, we sort of guess 50% loss before you start showing subtle changes in your cognition. A terrible thing for the doctor, but actually a gateway to a potential treatment of the preclinical disorder. Now, I've seen had doctors say to me, how could you possibly treat a normal person? So I say, well, if I could diagnose it, I certainly would. But even if I don't diagnose it, I've been using, I've been using inoculations against, uh, against and vaccinations against diseases in healthy children, and you accept it. So why is this such an unusual thought. Do symptoms matter? Well, as I've just described, only a little. What weight to this pathology is the gold standard? Average brain, 1.4 kilograms. Average brain after a death of an Alzheimer patient, somewhere between seven and 900 grams. So it's completely wasted. It's end stage. What did the liver doctors find when they had end-stage liver biopsies and the renal doctors when they had end-stage renal biopsies? Not very much. They found out when they went in there early. Then they found the mechanisms. Do we compensate? Well, I've mentioned one or two facts. The brain is a highly redundant organ. The plasticity depends on that redundancy. So these are the sorts of issues that we have at hand. All right, so let's ask our basic scientists for help. Actually, doctors don't do that, but I think they should. Let's just do it today. So across spatial scales, from whole brain up to sub-molecular resolution, let alone sub-cellular, we have a vast number of methodologies, some of which have won Nobel Prizes. How do we do our science? We focus. We're not worried about someone else doing something with a slightly different molecule. We want to know about our molecule. We want to know about our microscopy. We want to know about our gene. We even go to the extent of taking a mouse, knocking out our gene, and calling it an Alzheimer mouse, where the behavioral correspondence between the mouse and the human is completely unknown. So this is the way we do neuroscience. And Kathinka, said something which I understood what she meant because I know her, but she said something wrong. She said we have a lot of knowledge in neuroscience. We actually have a lot of facts in neuroscience. And then she went on to say we had no overriding scaffold in which to hang these facts, something people might call a theory or a blueprint or whatever you like. And that's true. We don't have anything, yet we have vast amounts of data. These are the number of papers published in neuroscience since 1990 to 2012. We're now at about 150,000 papers a year. Neuroscience is becoming more and more popular. Plenty and plenty of facts. But do we have an integration plan? Do we represent our data in the same way, any data curation? Do we link across spatial levels? Is there any plan to transfer these facts to knowledge and knowledge in, hum uh, in animals to humans? No plan to go beyond DSM-5. DSM-5 is purely based on symptoms and signs. 
One of the greatest discoveries of the Human Genome Project is the following, that the Huntington gene, which is dominant, which is completely predictive of the presence of, presence of Huntington's disease in the future if the patient survives long enough, can present in any of five, if not six, different ways. So there is no direct correspondence from gene to disease manifestation. Taken the other way around, if you take spinocerebellar degenerations, which are a reasonably well-known neurological condition, there are currently 25 partially dominant, not fully uh, penetrant uh, um, uh, mutations, which cause exactly that syndrome. 25 different ones. And they don't seem to be associated in any way along pathways, on proximity, on chromosomes, or anything similar. So we have a, a major problem, which is that we have to force ourselves to leave the linear world into the complex world. We have to stop talking about t-tests and p's. We really do. I mean, you know, my kids at the age of 11 are learning about p's and t-tests. At the age when they're doing their, they're going to college, they already know about, uh, about complex mathematics. Things that are not in our tradition, but which are absolutely vital. The fact that if A causes B in this context, it causes this, fact, this thing, and A, which causes B in another context, causes something completely else, different. That is nonlinearity, and that is what we're dealing with in the highly complex organization of this remarkable organ. Now, the other thing that we are guilty of is ignoring information technology. Whether we're medics, whether we're basic scientists, we have not taken up information technology in the way that meteorologists have, in the way that people who construct aircraft have, in the way that the astronomers have. Some of you may have seen the paper in a half ago in Nature, which predicted the shape and construction of the universe currently from the, all the information obtained from telescopes around the world about the, after the first 30,000 years beyond the Big Bang. And the correspondence was absolutely remarkable. Big data, finding your hypotheses in the data, not thinking with a four-dimensional organ about a complex machine that has millions of, of dimensions. It would be total serendipity to be able to think up some unifying theory of the brain from a human brain. The brain cannot understand the brain, someone said. The brain needs a supercalculator to understand the brain. Brain plus supercalculator will understand the brain. That's a question of faith, I grant you. I'm a scientist, I don't have faith, but I still believe that to be true, at least as my ruling hypothesis. I don't need to go through this list just to remind you that most of these things well, certainly, uh, in terms of Google, we're in the garage 18 years ago and are now worth 100 billion. Things changing extremely fast. They're changing so fast that a lot of people are still talking about clouds and databases when they're talking about going to big data. Just remember that. I'm going to come back to it. Now, in medicine, actually, when you go to nonlinearity, to complex analysis, and complex statistics, then you can actually do some very interesting things. This is a paper published in 2008. It shows that with normal clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, this particular group of about 80 patients, we actually got correct classification of about 80%, which is pretty good compared to the 70% that has been found everywhere else, if we used post-mortem pathology as the gold standard. So the rest were dements, but from other causes, and they were normal subjects. If we used a very simple MRI scan, anatomical, T1 weighted, maximize the contrast between gray and white matter, and put it through a technique derived from machine learning called a support vector machine, a machine that classifies in binary fashion after having been trained on a group of cardinal representatives of the two. So we, I got hold of a lot of my friends in America, in Japan, uh, in Europe, and got hold of scans of patients who had gone to post-mortem, 
who either had only Alzheimer's disease or were actually normal. Not normal in a cognitive sense, or at least normal in a cognitive sense, and did not have plaques and tangles and all the relevant things. So we trained the SVM on that. And then when we looked at a group of patients who also went to, po or the, uh, who also went to post mortem and had the AD or normality confirmed, we were up to 95% with one scan. Now, that hasn't been taken up by radiology. I'm not sure why, but that's a fact. And it may just reflect that medicine moves forward slowly. Another way in which informatics can help is to federate data. So an image is worth a thousand words, it is said. It's probably worth a billion data points. You have to think of these images as sets of pixels where each pixel can be referred to any other database to pick up information that has been found out about that site in the brain. So these are like uh, informatics encyclopedias, if you like. And there are all sorts of techniques. This is a standard human brain where you can strip off the face and the skull, you can strip off the gray matter, you can look at the connectome, you can look at this, you can look at the function, you can look at the structure. This is a, an interesting image because it's an image of the development of the mouse brain through to the human brain. So this is millions of years. Um, grosso modo, I know it does not a linear thing, but let's just imagine it like that way. So this is, this is a different sort of image. This is another sort of image which uses special techniques. It's a brain that's been put into an oil, which has rendered it transparent to a particular wavelength of monochromatic light, so that you could do Golgi staining in, 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 in uh, post-mortem again, but in a very delicate and precise fashion, following the fibers of the, uh, of the cells. This is, a, this is something that was um, a technique that was discovered in uh, the Polytechnic of, uh, of Vienna in Austria, sometimes taken up by others and called Claire. So there are ways in which we can bring data together and federate them. But the other thing that we have to do as we go forward is to move forward from our classical Cartesian model. Complex systems cannot be analyzed in this way. Cartesian model where a mental theory is mathematically expressed, confronted with relevant data, a nice subjective thing, that. And then there's parameterization of the model to optimize it. More introduction of the human bias before facts are obtained. That's what we are asked to do by the NIH or by the AMRC or by the ERC when writing our grants. It's pure reductionist science. You have to have a good hypothesis and you have to have a good design and so on and so on. But in fact, there are other te technologies and there are other ways of thinking about data. And someone's already talked about multivariate data and multimodal data and large amounts of data and the algorithms that are used in order to go through those large data sets in order to demonstrate mathematical structures by correlation or by classification or by both, which produce hypotheses essentially which are also mathematically expressed, just the same as here, and which can then be taken to the doctors, to the physiologists, to the therapists, to the pharmacologists, where they can be allowed to characterize them in their domains. And here the hypothesis comes not from the imagination, but it comes from the data themselves. And we live in an extremely data-rich environment. So this is what the Human Brain Project is based on. Simulation modeling from bottom up looking for hypotheses and generating rules which determine the relationship between each level. One of the great criticisms at the beginning of the Human Brain Project was this is a ridiculous thing to spend so much money on because there's an infinite number of degrees of freedom that underlie this problem presented in this way. Well, it just takes a little thought to say, well, hang on a moment. It all starts with DNA four base pairs, the degrees of freedom go like that. And then it builds up in complexity. And at each level, there are rules which we know the rules from DNA to RNA, or DNA to messenger RNA to RNA to proteins. We don't know the rules about how they're distributed amongst the different cells. We don't know how they then go on to form the microcircuits or the circuits or the systems if those, uh, if those exist. They are at the moment figments of our imagination. But we can work out the rules. After all, in 57, 
Huxley and Hodgkin got Nobel Prize for working out one of those rules, saltatory conduction. There are plenty of rules, and all of them can be expressed mathematically, and it's a question of working them out, because at each level, as you provide more and more rules, so you decrease the degrees of freedom until cognition will come out of it like a little fountain. Give me a little fountain. Um, this is something that is very important. Now, clearly you can have rules developed at different levels and try and integrate them through each other, but the principal drive has to be from bottom up. And that is exactly what we're on about. So, in the medical informatics platform, sub-project eight, what we decided to do is to federate all the data in Europe's hospitals. Now, why Europe's hospitals? Because Europe's hospitals are socially funded and therefore every piece of data on me is mine, but it's also a little bit of my countrymen's data and my European colleagues' data, because they pay for it as well, because I pay through my taxes. So we thought people will probably accept that their data are used for medical research, and that's a probability that has been confirmed in social science. Doctors are trusted. I think it's because they're conservative, but other people think it's because they're good people. <laughs> we will take data on behaviour, neuropsychology, brain imaging, brain physiology, blood, uh, genetics, anything you like, and then we'll need to integrate those data. And that will be an interesting thing to do. And then we will data mine those data to find causal models which we will simulate and obtain knowledge from in order to give us biological signatures of disease, which will include biological information that will give us ideas about new targets which come out of the biology. New targets, trials where we will have defined the diagnosis, you will have a definite diagnosis, whatever it is, however it's named, so that you can then do trials on 10 versus 10 instead of 30,000 versus 30,000. You will have a way of giving patients some sort of idea about prognosis. Because a homogeneous group of people who are identical in terms of their genetics, their physiology, their anatomy, and all the other aspects of brain disease will constitute the disease. So this is the transformation from DSM-5 to DSM-6 that we think should happen, the integration of biological information into the clinical information. Now, what sort of data do we have? We have data of poor quality, which is clinical data. It's terribly poor in quality, but the solution to that is to get millions of people's data, because we know that then solves the problem. Think of the Higgs boson. That's how they did that. They had crap data, but they collected two, three, four months' worth before a beautiful signal came out of the, out of the noise which had been squashed down by the, the amount of data. We also have research data, which is of very high quality, but of which we have very little volume. So the first idea is that we will use this to validate our results with this, or at least to validate our methods with this. So this I've just said. Its protection of this data is the big problem. You want to be damn sure that no one's going to go and corrupt the results of your tests when they go fiddling around with the data stores in the hospitals. You also want to be damn sure that you're protected for privacy, particularly if you've got some funny disease that currently is not up to uh, acceptance by the rest of uh, the population. Research databases are also protected. I've put culturally, but I should put anti-culturally. This is, this is the Victorian scientist who's put his data into a database and then surrounds it with three firewalls and won't let anyone else look at it because he feels that data equals the Nobel Prize and fails to remember that his brain will have to work a little bit before he can get that Nobel Prize or she. This is being tackled by the NIH and now by the ERC and by the MRC and certainly by the Wellcome Trust. You don't get your money unless you put your data out there. And, and I li recently listened to Christoph Koch when he told us that they put all their raw data out on that. I said, well, how often have you been gazumped? Never. You, you have to know what you're looking for. You, you have to have some ideas, or you have to be able to have the algorithms, or you have to be able to generate the hypothesis from the big data. And then we have pharmaceutical databases, and these are protected commercially. The interesting thing is that pharmaceutical companies are very rich, which means they've got a lot of intelligent people in them. 
So if you go to them and say, actually, I'm not interested in your, all your data, I'm just inter interested in your failed trials. Well, there are quite a number of those, aren't there? Would that be 80%? 90%? I don't know. And then, actually, I'm not interested in all your failed trials at all. I'm interested in the placebo arms of your failed trials. Well, one company, I won't mention its name, it begins with S, has given us 400 patients bang like that. So I'm sure the pharmaceutical industry, with its very structured data, will be very, very helpful in this sort of endeavour. If we could show that we can do it whilst protecting privacy and not corrupting it. So this is very important. And we made a decision right up front to really solve this straight away. So at the moment, you depersonalize. But as all of you know, know your birth date, know your genome, and uh, know your sex, then you can be found in even a very large database. So in addition to depersonalization, we decided we had to work with aggregated data. At least 10 patients together, so you can't get back. Once you have an aggregate, then you're anonym anonymizing. When you're anonymizing, in European law, you're not subject to any of the rules because you can't get back. And indeed, we do, as you'll see in a moment, double aggregation. Then people say, well, how do you know about the statistics of that? Actually, the statistics work out fine. A little bit of Bayesian this, a little bit of fiddling with an equation like that, and the statistics are actually easier to do than anywhere else. Consent. This is where our social science colleagues are very, very helpful. Lots and lots of people are perfectly prepared to give broad consent. At the Shuv here, there's a project going forward now, taking genetic data and blood data from everyone who comes in. They opted in, but they asked whether they want to opt out. No more, up to about 10% opt out, no more than that. We can live with that. And the question of retrospective and prospective data disappears if you can guarantee privacy. And then you have the management of the ethics. Well, this we want to leave with the local ethics committees because they have functioned so remarkably well. Be they in, farm, in the pharmaceutical industry, though there have been just one or two little problems recently, but in, in very large extent. Pharmaceutical industry and certainly in the hospitals and so on, this has been the bedrock of why people trust doctors, essentially. And then the value and credibility of science, which over the last 50 years has grown enormously, as people have begun to use things like computers. Oh, what's that? That's an interesting thing. That happens here, I suppose. Yeah. Let me just go back. There we go. Oh, yes, and a little beep as well. That's nice. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, this is what we propose. This red line represents a hospital or a pharmaceutical database or a research database. It's your firewall. You're in charge of it. You have to guarantee that it is not corrupted, so it mustn't be touched, and that if it is destroyed, you have copies off-site. They're called archives. Right? So that's what, that's, that's what you're interested in. And you're interested in deciding whether data comes out or doesn't come out. We ask for one archive copy where we can make all the files that are here uniform. That's easy done in these days. We want the data to come real time and it will be depersonalized using your depersonalization algorithms. Industry standard, top industry standard. So we never move or corrupt the original database. So that deals with a lot of problems. We then pre-process on hardware in your hospital. We denoise. We've been doing that in imaging for a long time. That's smoothing. We standardize and anatomically normalize. Mean, standard deviation, plus one, minus one. Anatomical normalization, we can do to submillimeter, you know, putting different brains into the same shape. Submillimeter very quickly and, uh, and completely automatically all sorts of numerical normalization, and then we have our data set in your hospital, which still you control. From the outside, our accredited researchers, or the hospital administrator, or the pharmaceutical epidemiologist, can ask a question, like you ask a question of Google. The question is split up and goes to this data set, which is all prepared, and looks on the raw data for data that is relevant to that question. 
takes it out. It's aggregated, encrypted, filtered once more to make sure there's no personal data left, and sent back where multiple aggregates from all the hospitals in the Federation come in, and a secondary aggregation is done. And then the statistics, the visualization, the testing of the hypothesis, the public health survey, uh, the am I putting my resources into the right to diseases at this time of the year as opposed to that time of the year of the hospital manager and so on can be done. And that gives a result. And then once the result is obtained, because we store all the provenance, and because this is continuously being refined and added to, we get rid of any data, aggregated or what, because we can run the whole thing with the same technique in the future. That's the plan, and that's what hospitals are accepting. So the Shuv is online, Freiburg is online, the, uh, the uh, Milan Hospital uh, is uh, coming online now. We're visiting the Salpetriere uh, next month, and we're visiting the National Health Service, and in particular, the Universities of Oxford, University College London, and King's College with its Institute of Neurology and Institute of Psychiatry at the beginning of December. We have in reserve Lille Hospital, Bordeaux University Hospital, Aachen Hospital. There's a whole group of hospitals in Poland who quite like the idea for reasons which might not uh, be entirely clear to you. The queries run directly over the files. So this is a data virtualization technique. And the question is, is it fast enough? It's faster than using a database on a data farm. It loads faster. It processes faster. It's being developed by the computer science department, Anastasia Elamaki in charge, at the EPFL, as part of SPA8. And what it allows is, quite apart from this, which is primary importance, allows one to work on large collections of files, because it's a federation, on multiple data formats, so all your legacy data can also be queried. It's not just prospective, but retrospective as well, if allowed. And it integrates with all existing tools. So nothing has to be changed. You have to pay 50000 to put in the hardware, and we bring along the software, and away you go. We will work with only five hospitals in the phase from May 2016 through two and a half years of the next stage. And at that point, we will put it out to tender as a commercial issue. So this is wealth generation in Europe as well. New jobs, new ways of looking at things, which is exactly what the FET program is designed to do. And what sort of questions will we be looking at? We want to data mine in real time. Oh, this is getting annoying. Um, I'm not sure what I can do about this other than switch off the, turn off the Wi-Fi. That's the thing to do. I'm very sorry. So we will, uh, disease signatures. <laughs> We want data mining in real time, continuously and iteratively. We want to populate the whole brain disease space, which is multidimensional, with these disease signatures. So it's absolutely essential that we don't have precise diagnosis before we start. It's absolutely essential we don't just deal with Alzheimer's disease, but we deal with all brain diseases, because that's the way we tease apart the different components and that's the way we maximize the differences between the real diseases. And that's the way we can iteratively improve that sort of diagnostic uh, uh, procedure, transforming DSM-5 into DSM-6 in, over the years as more and more data are collected. And what this will do is allow one to see where there are data missing. So it might direct research in the right, in, into the right areas. It might ask where... Um, uh, are there too many data, or where do data seem completely out of kilter with the rest? So there is a possibility there that this sort of, as a background activity, may give a lot of indications where further clinical research is required. The data visualization will be with a hypothesis. And there it may be epidemiological or health services research. And then there will be standard research, hypothesis testing and clinical trials which will uh, be carried out in a similar fashion. We have to do all sorts of things to the data uh, once it comes. Uh, uh, sorry, when it's being prepared, we have to extract various components because the data are very complex. For example, it'd be quite nice to have all 100,000 pixels of brain anatomy in there, but it would be extremely um, costly in terms of computer power. So 
getting out functional or other brain anatomical areas in the way that was described earlier on would be useful. So we have some preliminary data. I put in a caveat, the preliminary data on 5,000 patients. So it's not big data yet. So it may all be wrong. But it's interesting. We got the data mostly from French researchers. Just to show you this is really possible. You know how... Yeah, OK, I won't say any more. <laughs> Lots of clinical scales and managements, PET and MRI scans, not complete for any patient, every, every, every patient by any means. And they were not just patients, there were a lot of normal people here as well, aged normal people. Uh, 500,000 to a million SNPs, also for a sub, subgroup of them. Some had the proteins, some had amyloid, amyloid in the blood, amyloid in the cerebrospinal fluid, cerebrospinal fluid. Um, biochemistry and so on, and we categorized them into five types. We did this, 5,000 on a simple 1 million Excel spreadsheet, you will need much more, and we used all sorts of different types of data mining, which we're exploring currently, because we don't know what the best data mining techniques will be yet. And here are the results using the same color code for people who appear normal and for people who appear Alzheimer. And this is an interesting one, because this one is associated with a pattern of atrophy, which is typical of Alzheimer's, of the sort that I talked to you previously. It's associated with APOE4, Alan. Oh, he's asleep, won't you? He's just, just got in. And then there's all sorts of other interesting genes and things associated with it. It's the largest one. It looks like it's going to be Alzheimer's disease. It needs to go to some doctors who then need to look at these patients and tell us what they look like. There are a lot of blue circles. You think, well, how can you have lots of normals? Well, you can have normals who age quickly or with normals who age slowly. You can have normals who are compensating for Alzheimer's disease, normals who are compensating for frontal temporal dementia. Normal normals. It's actually expected. We, we were extremely encouraged by the fact there were different types of normals. And you'll see that many of the SNPs are associated with different patterns so that you get families of diseases with different rules describing them. And then you get little outliers all on their own. Which are the prion diseases? Alzheimer's disease or just uh, individual things like Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease? Here's a nice little one. A particular type of pet pattern, particular types of, of uh, haplotypes associated, particular types of... Uh, so th these are the sorts of visualizations. There are other visualizations related to integrating the medical side. So here you have DSM categories, which are in the center here. This is from the Shuv Hospital. And then subcategories and sub-subcategories. And then there were 9,242... Sorry, 2,078 of whatever's there, patients came through the doors in this year. And you can then begin looking at various other aspects of this, how various symptoms associate with each other. You can uh, look at how uh, they're expressed, um, what the uh, sex distribution is, what the component of vascular is in there, uh, what the different names used for the same diseases, how many there are uh, in relation to the same label. We have to get these labels organized, get the ontogenies organized. There's an awful lot of work to be done here. But damn it, Google did that. That's why you get sensible results when you ask a Google question. They have all those ontogenies worked out. In fact, there are many ontogenies already out there which we can look at. And then these are symptoms which associate with each other. There's one very interesting one in relation to early Alzheimer's disease. It's urinary tract infection. Now, you know, in classical medicine, you'd say, oh, oh, well, that's easy then. Urinary tract infection causes Alzheimer's disease because there's an association. Actually, the fact of the matter is, if you're a clinician, you will know that if you have early Alzheimer's disease and get a urinary tract infection, your cognition declines. You treat the infection, your cognition comes back to what it was before it declined. That's why they're associated. Another example of why thinking linearly is really not the thing to do. So, I'm coming to the end. The integrated view of the medical informatics uh, uh, platform is that we have to acquire and federate data. So we have to capture it and then query it, work out the ontologies we've just been talking about. We have to mine the data, so we need medical intelligence tools for cat categorization. We need workflows, we need curation. We don't know how much curation we need because we haven't tested it on very, very large 
samples yet. We need integration and operation, users, communities, outreach, hospitals. The people most interested in this at the moment are aged between 25 and 35. So I'm afraid all of you are out of this. So at the end of this talk, I won't have a crowd in front of me wanting to know more, because that's what I get nowadays. There are also hospital administrators. They can see how this can help them with their buying, with their, where they put their resources. So there are lots and lots of people, and the most interested people are, are the patients. I recently spoke to a, a patient group uh, associated with, um, with traumatic brain disease. As you know, we had a famous patient here in Lausanne last year, and so they thought they would get me there because I had looked after him. Uh, but they were absolutely fascinated by this and immediately wanted all the contacts, the websites. They wanted to know how they could help. And indeed, we're prepared to say to them, well, you know, some of this work is extremely boring, but you could do it because it's like drawing lines between different names. They're in there. They want to be involved. The same way as the HIV patients were involved. They were so involved, they took over the agenda. You guys will remember that. So this is the platform, and it's going to work for another two and a half years, well, with another half year, three years, and then we hope that it will become something that is taken off our hands by industrial R&D, by people who service, by people who create apps. We'll have an app shop for doing particular types of analyses. Hospitals and so on will be able to work on this in their own hospital or as part of the federation. And if a hospital director comes in and says, I'm scared, his IT person will be able to switch off and the whole thing won't fall down because it'll be distributed. It'll potentially undercut Oracle, potentially undercut data warehousing. I'm now fantasizing. You know? But just, just, just let those dreams roll because that's the way things happen. Future neuroscience, Henry Markram. Magnificent paper in Cell a week and a half ago which sweeps away the arguments against simulation, looking for rules, and trying to produce the first blueprint of how the brain is organized at different spatial scales. To my eye, potentially a Nobel Prize winning paper. Future medicine, that's what I've just shown you. We're nowhere near a Nobel Prize, but if we can make the lives of people better who have Alzheimer's disease, or any dementia for that matter, or any psychiatric disease, where at the moment we don't have many drugs and we still have Sigmund Freud's shadow over us, and future computing, where the computer people, they look at the brain, 1.4 kilograms, and the caloric equivalent of two bananas a day, and then they look at one of these enormous data warehouses. I'm sure you've got one at Nestle, which can, you know, you need a little mini atomic power station to run. And then they say, well, hang on, this is matter, and this is matter. So the laws of physics and the laws of chemistry apply to both. There has to be a correspondence of some sort. So the first correspondence is to go from von Neumann binary computing to what's called neuromorphic computing. And indeed, in Heidelberg, Karl-Heinz Meyer, who is the leader of that group, is constructing, is, is manufacturing neuromorphic chips, which give you some sort of stochastic response to the signals coming in and out. So I finished. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I don't have anything more to say to you. I assume that we will save all the questions till afterwards. Uh, I don't know how we you did it in the first we session. Yes, yeah, so we, we do you want to save? Q &A. Okay. Excuse me? We were doing Q&A immediately, I think. Sure, sure. Immediately, then, please. <coughs> well, you, you must moderate it. <laughs> well, <laughs> questions? Uh, yes, and yes, and yes. Uh, uh, <coughs> so, very interesting. And I, I'm just, I was recently in Amsterdam at the world meeting for, for imaging, so where all the big imaging centers came, Stanford, Rotterdam, and Holland. And, and, and my question to you is, because it turns out, which I didn't know, that the big American company is actually buying the clinical data and the images, and so they're basically doing exactly what you kind of do. Google and IBM is in this. Yeah, yeah. And so my question is, what's the difference what the Europeans are doing vis-a-vis -vis the, 
these big corporations and and also the I was told there's a big effort now I think at Stanford where the will image and do the whole thing you proposed for okay. 50,000 people to define what's a healthy sure. human being. So how, what do you actually comparing your networks to? Okay, so, so it's a complex question, but I'll try and answer simply just the, the, the principles. So the, the first thing is, it's perfectly clear since we started doing, preparing this and getting it funded and so on, it's got, it, it said it's got a billion funding over 10 years. Actually, it's 500 million with 500 million complementary from industry, nation states, universities, and so on. And then with the H2020 cuts, it's actually 400,000 and, and so on. But anyway, who cares? I mean, there are 170 labs, 70 PIs. That means at least one postdoc per lab over 10 years. We can do lots with that. No one laughed. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, we go on. In those five years, lots has happened. Um, America has produced its brain project, the Obama brain project, which is a very interesting project. How does it differ? What America has taught us is that follow technology, get the technology right, and then you get the discoveries. And that's been the history over the last 50, 60 years. Um, and so that's what they've done. They had uh, first a, a, a sort of free-for-all, then a, a committee was formed, and then that committee has largely, you correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but distributed the money to themselves. They were all very high level, and, and they're concentrating on getting the technologies right. You know, all sorts of interesting things. So they're going to generate new data. Uh, we're saying there's enough data, at least for the first phase. We need to do this before we can know where we need new data. They're saying, but we need to standardize our data, we need to curate it. And we're saying, well, if we can get the stuff off the hospitals, then we've got big data. Then, again, we can get going, we can start building the models and indicating where there are data which need to be, to be produced. So that's one big difference, which makes us very complementary. And so we're working a lot with them. I've got three big groups in my uh, SPA. I don't pay them. But, but they're, they're involved whilst they're involved in, in, in their own. So there's that complementarity. And now there's a, a, a big push in China, which is also complementary, a big push in Japan, and a smaller push from Australia, uh, the ones that we really know about now. It said Australia and Singapore are doing something together. So there's, there's more and more people going to get involved in this. Now, the other people that are involved are exactly as you say. I, IBM with Watson which is deep learning, which needs data. The more data it gets, the better it is. So we, they're looking to us at the moment. Google, uh, artificial intelligence. My postdoc is the head of artificial intelligence in Google. His offices are on Russell Square, right next to University College London, where I have my, have my laboratory. And so we're talking to each other. But I think this is the sort of problem where you don't put walls around yourself. It's the sort of problem where you, you, you really try and solve it. You get out there and you put the data out there, you put the ideas out there. I'm talking to you about all sorts of ideas which are not quite there yet, which are coming along and so on. Because we really need everyone to be pushing in the same direction. So um, if you can get that message across to people who ask you, then you'll do this whole area in enormous service. I think, I think you were first and then back there. And I'm going to let you harness decide on the time here. Let's say those two questions. Two questions, and then because there are so many questions here. So you and then. Very nice overview. I, I just wanted to ask, um, so for modeling and simulation, you made a very nice case for multi-scale integration ac across uh, scales in the brain, across data sets. For disease progression modeling and mechanism discovery, uh, you made a case for machine learning as your model and, and, uh, and uh, genetics. Uh, gene expression pathways, gene expression networks. I'm wondering what will it take to start to integrate brain models, neural tissue simulations into disease progression modeling and disease mechanism modeling in the project? Well, well I'm, I'm delighted I'm, I'm stimulating your imagination to that level. I, I, I don't know, but I know we're going to have to go through that phase. 
if, if the predictions I was, when I was, when I, I was very honest, I said I was fantasizing at one stage, you know. So, but to get to there, that's exactly the sorts of questions we'll have to ask. We don't yet know what sort of data mining we should be doing. We don't know whether it should be one uniform data mining algorithm, which is specifically built for this, or whether it's a set of algorithms which are already, there are lots and lots of algorithms out there. As soon as you, as soon as a medic, you go out there trying to learn about the informatics world, you suddenly go, wow. I need six years of high-intensity training, which is what I've just had. And still, I don't know that much. But what I do know is that the data capture is possible, because we've now got a prototype out there doing it. And we've got to scale that up now to the five R&D hospitals we want to in involve with us. If it scales up, then it's The only problem then will be, is Europe able to commercialize it or not? But if it isn't, America will do it, so it'll be all right. Uh, there's someone over there. Good afternoon, Tel Aviv. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent uh, lecture. Can you talk into the microphone, Ma uh, Amos? I can't hear you. I'm getting old. Uh, thank you for the excellent lecture. Um, you started off by uh, having the brain project uh, in order to find out how the normal brain works, uh, bottom up. And then you went on to tell us about how you are going to solve Alzheimer's disease. And I think there is a big problem there, because uh, the, uh, uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, you, uh, uh, we define the patients based on the phenotype, the either clinical phenotype or yeah. pathological phenotype. Yeah. And uh, so there is circularity there. You want to understand the start bottom up by starting top down with the diagnosis. OK, and we no, know... I don't want to start top down at all. The point I was making is, that we must move on from pure clinical definition. I kept saying DSM-5 to DSM-6. Okay. I think that we are at a complete impasse diagnostically at the moment. We make so many errors in these fundamental diseases. I didn't even talk about psychiatry. I mean, you know, in psychiatry, there was a paper in the Lancet Neurology two and a half years ago, five of the major syndromes, you know, bipolar, uh, uh, depression, uh, schizophrenia, and, and the others, and the big GWAS. And what did it show? It showed over 20 different haplotypes and mutations associated with it. No specificity for, for syndrome. All right. Completely so unspecific. So Just the psychiatric disease. So we've got to get away from simple clinical definition. So the question is, can we define Alzheimer's disease? Because when, we, when I make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in patient A, this is due, as you imply, uh, many contributions of many polymorphisms, as well as many environmental factors. And these causes are completely different from was, the, know, of the next patient. So, is, so how do we make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease okay. and how do we solve the problem of the cause of Alzheimer's disease okay. if we cannot define it as a disease because we don't, we, they do not have a common mechanism? Well, the first thing to say is Alzheimer's paper defining his disease has three patients' principles. One of them that's been redefined by most neuropathologists as tertiary syphilis. So even Alzheimer wasn't entirely clear what he was talking about. Second issue is... Imagine that now we, we build, on the one hand, the model of the normal brain. So we have the sets of rules. And then we have our populated disease, brain disease space with groups of disease signatures. And I am a doctor, and she's the patient. We have a contract of trust. We already have that. That's how medicine works. So without going to ethics committees or anything else, I can say to her, look, I've got a whole series of test results here, plus all my clinical examination and our discussion. There won't have been much of a discussion because it's usually the, 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 the husband or wife or the partner who, who explains what's wrong because the patient hasn't got much idea about it because he's demented. But anyway, we'll get all that information together. And I say to her, and I will send that to a, to, to a, to a point where it, will be, it will be compared to the disease signatures. And we'll find which one you belong to or which one you're very, very close to. And it will send us back a list of potential diagnoses, not in terms of Alzheimer or him or her or, 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 or dementia even, but it'll be a diagnosis which is specific about the, the, the genetics, the physiology, the anatomy, uh, the clinical aspects, and so on and so on. And at that stage, we'll be able to say, well, right, you're close to these. Now, what do we know about that disease signature? And then we'll have links 
to all the papers that have already talked about this disease and the clinical trials that have been associated with this one, and we'll have indications of what might be the best drugs, what is the, what is the, what is the usual prognosis, and so on. And, and then there'll be a discussion between the doctor and the patient, and then a decision will be taken. So it's simply increasing the armamentarium that's available to the doctor from, you know, did the toe go up or down when I scratched the, the bottom of the foot? Were the reflexes normal or abnormal? And what was the mini mental state? Plus a scan and my experience to something much richer and something much more precise and something which really defines homogeneous groups and therefore is a more precise diagnosis and potentially much more precise prognosis and an indication of therapy. But all that we're talking about 10, 15, 20 years beyond. So we're not abandoning Alzheimer's disease, but we're just saying we need to move forward along this line. And it's not circular because if you have the normal model with the normal rules and then you have a disease signature with something wrong, you can transpose that into the normal model and see how that then you know, goes out to the cortex and how it propagates into higher levels of organization. And you can see whether that prediction in silico resembles what you're finding in vivo. And if it does, oh well, then you can do a little bit of in silico therapy. What if I just change the activity of this enzyme a little bit? What happens then? You might even get toxicologists say, oh, hang on, you've got what you wanted there, but look what's happening over here. That would cause such and such. You would have a test bed which would be much better than having to wait 10 years for the result of a clinical trial. Now, I, again, I'm, I'm projecting, this is, this is, these are visions I'm having. And I'm probably a saint or something, you know. But, 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 but they're, they're credible because we're showing proof of principle at the early stages. So they're still credible and should be followed. They're better than what we got. We have time for one last question, Johannes tells me. But I can't resist just giving a, a brief comment to the point of the, the phenotype that was raised because it connects to the point I was trying to make on variability. Yes. There is an epistemological challenge in the Human Brain Project that is important, and that concerns the difference between trying to simulate a medium brain, the average brain, which is an entity that simply does not exist, and simulating a real brain as it exists in individuals. That is a very important epistemological challenge that concerns not only empirical neuroscience, but also philosophy, which is the part that I, I lead in the Human Brain Project, just as a short <laughs> remark. Uh, but can I, can I, was, I respond to that? Yes, please. Well, I mean, my first response is a very, very practical response. At the moment, with IBM coming up to um, exascale computing in 2019, we can only dream of having the average brain um, at one point in time. So we, we don't, we, we're not talking about following things in time yet, because we're talking about the whole brain. Once we have the whole brain, you can parcel things up, and therefore you could see ways forward in which to get into the time domain and so on. So let, a little bit of realism just to make up for the visions. But in terms of the epistemological problem you raise, you know, when I get on my, on my BMW R850R, and I meet another one in the road, I know that his R850R is the same production model as mine, but that they're very different. Because he doesn't have my uh, Canton de Vaux sticker on his box. He probably hasn't got boxes on. He may have a windshield, and I don't have a windshield. But we're still on the same thing. So the epistemological question is a question of at which level do you set your window? And I, I don't believe in the, in the average human brain at all, but I do believe in the rules. And I believe that the rules will always have uh, a little jitter around them. And I believe that that is what, what defines the difference between individuals. Sometimes the jitter is quite large, like an X and a Y chromosome. Sometimes the jitter is really tiny. But we know that we're humans and we're not monkeys. So that, that, that's at the level at which I'm working. Now, one question. Please don't step down. I would like as long as I can respond. As long as I can respond. <laughs> First of all, you have two hours of free reign. That's all right. There's a few things which cannot be left to the very end of the discussion. First, you misquoted Francis Osme, who said indeed that one human brain cannot understand the brain. But that's not. The proposal. The proposal is many brains to be used yeah. to understand the human brain. And computers. And this is the yeah. beginning of the Neurosciences Institute. Second, 
you said the cholinester is inhibitors and lamantine is the most expensive plastic. I would say that Adasco is quite lousy, incredibly well validated. And I also would say that you as a neurologist use many, many drugs which have some validated and thirdly to describe... Can I respond to that one? You want, no, no, I listen to you through. You listen to you <laughs> Why would be the rules different for us? Well, because I gave a talk. Okay, then please. I would just say that um, amantadine can be used to quiet an anxiety over a period during the development of Alzheimer's disease where patients are anxious. So I'm not saying that it's a placebo in the sense of it doesn't have any effect on patients in Alzheimer's. I'm saying it is a placebo in terms of dealing with the causation of Alzheimer's disease and stopping the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, but you know, you didn't say none of these are dealing with disease progression. These are all symptom treatments. That's what you meant. Well, I only had we 30 agree. minutes. I only we had 30 agree. minutes. Okay, okay. We all agree. But Good. You know, Leon Next. Talbi, many words, set the goal that if we don't make clinical trials, we will never find active agents. And if we find active agents, many times they help us to roll backwards the genesis of the disease. You treat many schizophrenics with antidopaminergic drugs, and we all know that's not the only reason. But what I really wanted to say is that it appeared from your talk, A, if big data use would have to be starting now. But for example, Siemens could, in the last eight years, call up four million breast cancers, which were imaged on a Siemens machine anywhere get them compared, independent of their relative size, look at the treatment history and treatment outcome. And this type of big data goes on. The big problem is what you mentioned about the Allen Brain Institute and your conversation with Koch, that the big data has to be truly big, that only then and only then yeah. becomes irrelevant how much noise in it. Yep. The problem is to know when it's big, big enough sure. that the noise is no longer... Empirical question. Enough. Empirical question. Yes, but this, is, this needs to be said because yep. this is where it will fail if it yeah, do it <laughs> Thank you. And thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> Okay, well, let's see. So, I probably have five minutes. <laughs> uh, in case you don't know me, that's who I am. I'm Rudy Tanzi. Um, I'm going to continue on Alzheimer's disease, but a uh, slightly different tack, um, a little bit more from bottom up. I'd like to make the argument that most of what we learned from, about Alzheimer's has come from genetics, that this is uh, the bottom up approach, and that genetics has taught us and continues to teach us much about the pathology of the disease, the etiology. Um, so I'll go into that, what, what the first genes told us, what the new genes are telling us. And then at the end, um, I would like to talk about a novel hypothesis that will be somewhat controversial and will probably take away all credibility if I had any during the rest of my talk. Um, but I, I feel strong, strongly enough about the new hypothesis at the end that I'm going to present it, and it uh, should be some fun. So, I'll just quickly go through this, that we already have heard much about what Alzheimer's is, the most common form of dementia, but it's an epidemic. I mean, folks, our lifespan is already 80 years old. At 85, 40 to 50% of people showing symptoms of this disease, never mind how many have pathology on the way. And uh, the current drugs are really just uh, better than nothing, modest and temporary benefit. Um, now, if we look at the, the, the pathology of the disease, we have plaques, we have tangles, we know that Plaques come from the amyloid beta peptide, which is from cleavage of APP by beta and gamma secretase. And the tangles come from tau protein, uh, especially in its hyperphosphorylated state. Um, now, it was George Glenner, back in the early 80s, who really first, mid 80s, who first formulated the beta amyloid hypothesis. Uh, he doesn't always get credit for this, but he called uh, Alzheimer's disease the commonest form of amyloidosis. 
So he, his English was a little off, common, I mean, most common. But basically, he, he said that, you know, Alzheimer's is an amyloidosis of the brain and that the rest of the pathology, including tangles, is started by amyloid. He also predicted in his paper where he described the amyloid beta peptide, um, that there'd be a gene for, for that, that, that leads to that a beta peptide on chromosome 21 because of Down syndrome patients having so much beta amyloid in their brain by middle age. And of course, he was right when we and others cloned APP back in the late 80s, it was on chromosome 21. And we know of four different genes that cause Alzheimer's disease in the 80s and 90s. Three of them, amyloid precursor protein, presenolin 1, presenolin 2, have mutations that guarantee with full penetrance the onset of autosomal dominant early onset FAD. And the majority of these mutations, almost all of them, increase the ratio of A beta 42 to A beta 40. They don't increase total A beta, okay? Only one mutation, the Swedish mutation, uh, which was used in the most famous transgenic mouse, TG2576, increases overall A beta production by making the APP more vulnerable to beta secretase cleavage. But the majority increased that ratio of 42 to 40. That'll be important later. And some mutations affect aggregation state. ApoE is a risk factor. Alan Rose is, is here. Hopefully he won't throw his tangerine at me when I tell you that amyloid causes uh, this disease. Um, E4 increases risk anywhere from 3.7 to over tenfold, depending on whether you inherit one or two copies. And, um, and one hypothesis for how ApoE uh, works is that it's involved with clearance of A-beta uh, from the brain, although ApoE's been shown to do other things. So this is, these are the, really the three pillars of pathology for Alzheimer's disease. You have amyloid beta deposition that we now know begins decades before symptoms. Tangles form in the brain and they spread through the brain like a spreading pathology. Um, and neuroinflammation, which probably is killing the majority of neurons in a full-blown Alzheimer's uh, patient. But one of the biggest questions over the last several decades since Glenner is, uh, you know, described what beta amyloid is made of, is does beta amyloid deposition actually lead to tangle formation? And for a long time, and still to some extent today, we have the people who believe in amyloid beta protein, those who believe in tangles, those who believe in neither. Uh, but what is the relationship? And the problem is when um, Alzheimer's mice were made, when the early onset FAD genes and mutations were put into mice, they basically got plaques, they got some neuroinflammation over time, this led to some memory impairment, but they didn't get tangles. So this led fuel to the fire to say amyloid doesn't cause the tangles, and, and, and the enraging debate is that the amyloid are the tangles that matter. Um, and so this, this became a big question. So we, in, in our lab, developed a system using human neurons made from stem cells. This is a paper from uh, the end of last year in Nature, uh, Ju Yan Kim and our group and my postdoc Sehun Choi were the main people who did the work. And that's not good. Wasn't me, my computer's still on. Okay. All right. Um, so, so basically, uh, this is basically using 3D cultures to grow human neurons and to, be, to, to in an attempt to recapitulate Alzheimer's pathology in a way that's more physiologically relevant than in a mouse. Uh, especially since we can't see full pathology there. So let me explain what we did. So many different studies were taken stem cells, whether they were iPS cells or human embryonic stem cells expressing Alzheimer's genes, and grew them in liquid culture. And you make A-beta and it floats around in the liquid and you don't see any pathology. So my, uh, my colleague in our unit, Duyang Kim, said, well, you know, Rudy, the, the brain's not made of liquid. You know, the brain is jello. The brain's made of gel. Uh, a beta is just floating around there. So what we did instead was grow the same human neurons made from stem cells in gel. This is matrigel. <clears throat> and lo and behold, A beta, some of it floats away into the liquid, but the majority of it stays in the gel and starts to aggregate into A beta oligomers and to plaques around neurons. And this was a big um, step forward. So what we what we're able to do is take human embryonic stem cells that you can buy commercially. These were the original lines that were made in and sold commercially in the States. We use lentiviral vectors to, to express APP and or presenilin mutations, FAD mutations. This is for the purpose of getting these cells to make A-beta. So we want to have a situation where we have neurons growing in a dish in gel, mimicking the brain, where A-beta is accumulating around these neurons in a gel-based medium. And then we have um, what we call uh, the, the, uh, the thin crust pizza and the deep, dust, uh, deep, deep crust pizza. So the thin culture, the thin crust, is where you have a little bit of gel, and it's thin enough, 0.1 to 0.3 millimeters, 
where you can then do immunocytic chemistry and actually look for plaques and tangles. And uh, the deep dish model, where you have uh, four millimeters of gel, allows you to take that like a chunk of brain and biochemically process it and do elizas for A beta content, tau content, et cetera. So let me show you what we found. First of all, this is just showing, uh, if I can get this to go, um, a, a 3D image of these neurons that are growing in gel and they're making connections, they're forming uh, so a, a, a kind of a primitive network of neurons in, in the gel and we let these neurons grow and somewhere um, around uh, six weeks out, what we see is this. This is confocal imaging and what you're seeing here, if I can get to go, yeah, what we're seeing here is your confocal imaging through that orange blob in the middle, which is a plaque. So in this dish, we were thrilled when uh, Du Yang Kim came into my office and we actually were able to grow a plaque um, in a dish, and you can see it here, confocally imaging through z-axis uh, through the, uh, the uh, uh, 3D culture. So the next question uh, became, um, you know, can we somehow block the amyloid? Can we show proof of concept for a drug that hits amyloid in this system? And for this purpose, we used uh, gamma secretase modulators. So these are not gamma secretase inhibitors like Lilly used. The problem was gamma secretase inhibitors blocked the gamma secretase cleavage of many other proteins in the membrane. And when you think about how many proteins in a membrane get their ectodomain shed, leaving behind a stub, that stub has to be removed. You can look at gamma secretase, where presenilin is the active protein in it, as a stubosome. It's how you get rid of your stubs. And so you can't have a cell live full of protein stubs that are not being removed. And that's why the Lilly drug, gamma secretase inhibitor, failed. Gamma secretase modulators don't hit that gamma secretase site that's analogous in other substrates like notch. These are allosteric modulators that only hit APP and affect the length of A-beta you make. I told you earlier, long versus short forms of A-beta. And so these, these compounds, which we've been working on for 15 years, we published them first in 2010, uh, hit the size of A-beta made after gamma secretase cleavage. And this is uh, the newer ones we just published last year. These are soluble forms of these modulators. The original ones weren't very aqueous soluble, so they weren't great drug candidates. So we did uh, quite a bit of work. We got an NIH Neurotherapeutics Blueprint Grant, where the NIH helps you like a pharma company would um, with CROs to develop your drug and to get it into clinical trials. And so the uh, description of our GSMs is probably more thorough in this biochemistry paper from 2014. But what we found, without, this is just a lead compound that's about to go into clinical trials early next year, is that in rats and mice, we were able to get a huge reduction in CSF and plasma A beta, um, even at, at five or 20, at 25 uh, mg per kg. So very, very effective in lowering A beta 42 with some effects on A beta 40. Um, but as I'll show you here, no effects whatsoever on notch. So the IC, this is a, a gamma secretase inhibitor where you can see you're blocking the proteolysis of notch, and that's probably one of the things that led to the Lilly uh, trial failing, where they were, they were preventing these cleavage events. Whereas the SGSM we're working with here, uh, looking at notch, even out at 25 micromolar, we're really doing nothing at all to notch. We're just not hitting that cleavage site at all. That's, in fact, the Lilly drug should have been called an epsilon secretase inhibitor because A beta 50 is the epsilon site you have to cut that first and then you chew back to 42 or down to 37. And this comp these compounds don't hit 50. They only affect how much of A-beta is chewed back um, by, if you see this diagram, by affecting how well APP can fit into the docking site elasterically of gamma secretase. So when we tried this in our cultures, here's DMSO, you're seeing a plaque form about six weeks into the culture. Uh, beta secretase inhibitors, which are also in trials, block the plaques. Gamma secretase inhibitors block the plaques, and you also see pretty good blocking of plaque, but not quite as thorough as these with the gamma secretase modulator shown down here. Um, and this just shows a close-up of that. Now, what we also saw, now we saw plaques, and we didn't really see tangles right away, but when we waited about two more weeks, this is about eight or nine weeks into the cultures, sure enough, we were able to see bona fide plaques, uh, tangles, which you're seeing here, a paired helical filament by, by EM, and I don't think in anyone I've shown, including, you know, died in the Wotawis, uh, Tangle people have said these, these appeared helical filaments. And a lot of other data in the paper showed silver staining and showed the evidence of tangles in the neurons. But it's really what, what, what nature really wanted was just to show 
true paired helical filaments, and this just shows a variety of them that formed here. So we're getting tangles, but we're getting them two weeks after you're starting to see plaques. So that was a clue that the tangles are following the plaques, that maybe the plaques are leading to the tangles. So, so what's that? Well, we could do that too. <laughs> so, so, now, so the thing was, you know, why don't mice get tangles when you put in genes, Alzheimer genes that cause amyloid? And one of the reasons is four repeat tau. In the brain, human brain, there's, this is the ratio of four repeat tau to three repeat tau. And you need four repeat tau to make tangles. And in a mouse brain, there's very little four repeat tau. And it turns out that when you grow human neurons in 2D liquid culture, there's also very, very little four repeat tau. But for some reason, when you grow them in 3D culture, the ratio of 4 repeat tau matches that of the brain. If you look at these other neuronal markers, this is 2D here, 3D culture here, and you can see for many neuronal markers, there's an exponential increase in expression. SLC17A7, BRIN2A, um, even tau is much more highly expressed. So these neurons are expressing neuronal markers at exponentially higher levels in 3D culture in gel where they're forming networks versus floating around in a 2D you know, liquid culture. So we believe that this is one of the reasons why we're seeing tangles. So the big question was if we block amyloid production, again using either beta secretase or gamma secretase inhibitors, can we also block the tangles? And sure enough, we do. This just shows the immunosic chemistry here, DMSO showing PHF1 as a classic antibody for looking at tangles. If you use beta secretase inhibitors or gamma secretase inhibitors, you dramatically lower the amount of tangles you see. You can also see this by looking at phospho tau. This is with DMSO, and now it's almost gone with PHF1 using, oops, using a, a beta secretase inhibitor. Or if you use a gamma secretase inhibitor here, you can see a, a dramatic reduction in phospho tau versus DMSO. So what that says then is that if you block the amyloid, and wait, you also block the tangles. So this we took as proof of concept that tangles follow amyloid and Alzheimer's disease. So then the editors at Nature who started running my lab um, said, <laughs> well, it's fine, but if, if you're saying amyloid directly causes tangles and that whole cascade thing was, was really not a cascade, because remember that Selko and Hardy said it's a cascade. Well, this, there's no cascade here. This is neurons in addition, a few astrocytes. There's no microglial cells and you're getting tangles directly, they said, you should be able to do one thing that allows your dish to be full of amyloid and still get no tangles. So obviously we tried every kinase inhibitor we could get, and what we found is when we blocked GSK, whoa, that's not good. That's not good at all. That's, that's uh, Heron Island in Australia, by the way. I highly recommend a dive trip there. Okay, let's see. Uh, boy. Okay, a little recap. <laughs> okay, quiz is over. Okay, um, anyway, um, so when we use a GSK3 beta inhibitor called azacenpalone plus another one called SB31, in both cases this allowed massive amounts of amyloid and plaques to accumulate in the dish, yet we, we saw no phospho tau, we saw no tangles. So this says that in Alzheimer's disease, in the DISH model, that tangles are induced by amyloid and it's GSK3 beta dependent. Doesn't mean only GSK3 beta, but at least this was one example where you could block a single kinase, have lots of amyloid, and not translate that into tangles in the DISH. And finally, nature, together with the PHF1, uh, immunoEM were happy and we got the paper out. Now, um, another question that they didn't ask us, luckily, but we've done since then is, okay, you're forming plaques, you're getting tangles, but are these neurons sick? Are these dysfunctional neurons? And this is where I want to show you um, what we did. So we're able to look at calcium imaging. This is using GCAMP6 as a calcium indicator. And what you're seeing here in the first panel is how these neurons should fire, looking at calcium imaging. These are controlled neurons three weeks into the dish, and you're seeing them firing. They're forming connections and firing just, just fine. When you look into the Alzheimer's cells, this is three weeks into the dish, you can see they're firing, but a little lethargic, not quite as much firing. You're also seeing some of these blobs in there where calcium's accumulating. And finally, seven weeks out, at this point, you have plaques 
and if, if some tangles in phosphatidyl forming, you're seeing very little firing. So I think this demonstrates that these neurons, as they're growing in the dish with amyloid and tangles, are not very happy compared to the control neurons, which are firing away. So this would say then, if I can get this to go, is that in the idea of the amyloid hypothesis, if we modify it beyond a cascade, that in this case, it shows that, yes, beta amyloid in human neurons can lead directly to tangles and neuronal dysfunction based on calcium imaging, but the tangle formation beyond the amyloid requires GSK3 beta. So I think, to, in my eyes and in many of my colleagues' eyes, I don't know about all, this kind of rests this debate that does amyloid lead to tangles in human neurons as opposed to a mouse, amyloid does lead to tangles. But of course, there are other ways to get tangles. There are many beta amyloid independent routes to get the tangles, concussion, traumatic brain injury, Lee Goldstein and I showed and, and, and athletes with concussion directly go to tangles, don't need amyloid. Oxidative stress models, you can directly get tangles. Frontal temporal lobar dementia mutations directly get tangles. So you don't have to have amyloid, but in Alzheimer's disease, it looks like it's an amyloid-induced tauopathy, is how I, would, how I would classify it. And that's what the dish basically says. Now, on the other hand, once you start forming tangles, for example, due to traumatic brain injury, you can get mixed pathology. So I think your question is good, Ed. You know, if you're forming tangles first and you have enough pathology, can you also wrap around to get plaques later on? And some of the mixed pathologies in frontal temporal lobe dementia would support that. So if a beta does cause tangles and neuro dysfunction, why did so many clinical trials targeting a beta fail miserably? And, uh, you know, and we know that there were trials that were trying to block a beta production, turning off the sp uh, spigot. Other trials that were trying to clear a beta from the brain, like uh, immunotherapy, gamma guard, alzimed, all of these trials failed. So this is where I need to turn to a famous American baseball player, which some of you may know, Yogi Berra. So how many of you heard of Yogi Berra? That's good, so, so okay, not too bad. So Yogi, not only was a legendary player manager, and I hate to say the word, but Yankees, I'm from Boston, um, <laughs> but he, was a, he just passed away this, this past year, and I thought, but nobody explains the whole amyloid journey of Alzheimer's disease better than Yogi Berra. Um, he was a treasured source of very odd yet often profound quotes. And after the failures that I just showed you, this quote I thought was appropriate, nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. <laughs> so um, people ran away from amyloid and, and, and many companies even ran away from Alzheimer's disease altogether. But he had another uh, famous quote, which was, you can observe a lot by watching. <laughs> so, so, and, 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 and what, what the field began to watch was when does amyloid actually begin to form? And that's when we can look at data like this, where you're seeing there's a 15 year gap between when you start to see plaques and, and amyloid in the brain versus when you start to see dementia. And if you look at this slide, basically, um, you see then that Amyloid is, is forming and peaking here. This is when MCI occurs, is, is amyloid's already be basically peaked and is beginning to plateau. Well, what were we doing? We were treating patients here with amyloid drugs. That's like having somebody with congestive heart failure who just had an MI go into the cardiologist and he says, don't worry, just take a Lipitor. Well, you had to do that 15, 20 years before, and I think that's what we're learning now is that amyloid does its job very early on. That's when you need um, to hit it. So another great uh, quote, we made too many wrong mistakes. <laughs> so Yogi knew, Yogi was following in his career the whole amyloid story. So <laughs> too bad he was a Yankee. Um, so, so now what we're seeing is that, is that basically, and you might hear more of this from, 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 from uh, Lon's talk uh, tomorrow, um, maybe, yeah. Um, on clinical trials that now we're, we're going more toward using imaging modalities for amyloid there are good imaging uh, uh, protocols, biomarkers, including looking for phosphor tau in spinal fluid, neuropsych assessment to see early on whether somebody's on their way to AD, and then treating it, trying to treat at those early stages once we have a decent amyloid drug, whether it's a beta secretase inhibitor, a gamma secretase modulator, um, an antibody uh, like Biogens, but doing it um, very early. And I would add that, you know, just to make a point that when, when someone has a tumor forming, even at the smallest level, we say they have cancer. And we treat them for cancer, but there are no symptoms. When somebody has some calcification and plaque in their heart, we say, you have heart disease. We start, treat, we start treating you. Exercise, diet, a statin, if necessary. You're doing CT scans, echocardiograms. You say you have heart disease. But in Alzheimer's disease, it's funny. We wait until somebody already has dementia. But in actuality, 
if you look at these, these graphs, I mean, they have Alzheimer's disease pre-dementia. This is just a silent stage of Alzheimer's disease. We talk about preventing Alzheimer's disease, pretending that it's only there when there's dementia, but really, dementia is the final stage of this disease. And I think we need a paradigm shift, just like we made for cancer and heart disease, even diabetes, that this is a disease before there's dementia. And we start not just preventing it, but treating it before there's dementia. So now you're seeing trials of beta secretase inhibitors. We're working on gamma secretase modulators. I hear Fars is also doing that. Um, Lily's working on solanezumab, aducanumab from Biogen, another drug I'm working on, PBT2 from Prana Biotech. But all these trials are now targeting A beta early. So we're treating at this pre-symptomatic or very mild stage, early stages of the disease. That's when you have to hit amyloid. And I would argue maybe even tangles. So, Yogi Berra, the future ain't what it used to be. <laughs> See, he had a quote for every single story on our animal. I'm not sure how he did that. So, I want to turn now to um, genetics, and I'm trying to hurry along a little bit, you know, just so that we have enough time for, uh, for a break. Um, but basically, in, in one of the first GWASs uh, we published in 08, we found a gene called CD33. Uh, these are some other genes that came out of case control GWASs. Uh, this was a family based and then many other genes came out. So now we have a whole slew of different genes that have come, ac come up across GWAS studies we, where we don't know what's going on in these genes. I mean, um, Peter Hislop, my colleague, calls GWAS, God, what awful science. <laughs> because, and, and I remember Story Landis, the head of, of NINDS, once said to me, why do you guys do these GWAS? It's like you're collecting baseball cards or stamps. What are you gonna do with these genes? You don't even know what they do. And, and you know what, they're right, because GWAS simply just vaguely points a finger to a region in the genome and says somewhere in there there's something going on, and it might be that gene where your SNP is closest to, or it might be a gene next door you don't really know. For certainly, in most cases, almost 99%, you don't have the mutation. You don't have the pathogenic variant that causes the disease. You just have knowledge that that gene matters because you have some common SNP that's been around for 100,000 years that showed uh, association. Well, what you need to do then is whole genome sequencing, or some people do whole exome. So this is what we've engaged in. And we did whole genome sequencing on 1,480 members from 437 families from the NIMH family sample. And believe me, it was much more work, time, and money QCing and processing that data than generating uh, the data, which is the real bottleneck, a petabyte of data, basically. We also did 16 brains with AD levels of plaques and in some, many cases tangles, but they had no dementia at depth at 80 years old. So what made them resilient? Um, and I'll tell you the, the answer according to Go Teresa gomez Isla, I'll show you the paper later, is that they had no inflammation. And all these 16 brains with plaques and tangles and no dementia, there was no inflammation. So that's what made them resilient. Um, generated the data, and the goal was, can we find the actual functional variants and mutations that influence risk in these genes that came up in GWAS that we all agree on by replication. So this is, this is a, these are the summary statistics of our whole genome sequencing. This is unpublished data. And in the NIH families, we found 46 million SNPs, 46 million. I, I was involved with the original Huntington's work with Jim Gasella way back in the early 80s, where we found the first 12 SNPs in the genome. First of all, I can't believe I'm doing the same thing you know, 30 years, 35 years later. Um, but now we get 46 million. We used to say, oh, there are 30 million variants across all of humankind. Well, no, just in these 400 families, there are 46 million variants that we found. And 4 million insertion deletions, never mind other copy number variants. Now, when you compare this, you can see, so we did um, 36x coverage of the genome. Decode published some whole genome sequencing data on Alzheimer's. They did 10x coverage. They found 20 million variants. We found 46 million. Now, two possibilities. One is in Iceland, there are fewer variants. Um, the other possibility is that you've got to do 36x coverage, the 10x coverage isn't enough. Interestingly, in the ADNI data set that we also processed, 800 samples, we found 38 million variants. So again, it could just be to be better coverage or it could be in Iceland or fewer. And same thing here, we found 4 million or so insertion deletions in, in Iceland decode, they found 1.4 million, so much fewer. So the big question, what do you do with this data? So the first thing we did was we performed a burden analysis. And so we were using, this, this shows you the list of known and GWAS confirmed AD genes in the chart, don't worry about reading it. But the question was, do AD genes 
contain more AD-associated mutations compared to a set of control genes. So to come up with control genes, you have to find 10 genes that are the same size as your AD gene with the same recombination rate. So you give them the same chance to have mutations. Same size, same recombination rate. So that's what these, these, are, these are the control genes used for each of the genes matched to these. And then the question was, do multiple rare mutations cluster in single AD patients and families? Is it gene burden of rare variants that might be the cause? And when we did the analysis, I'll show you here, we, this is a little cumbersome, but basically we looked at the exome, we looked at only deleterious mutations predicted to impact gene function, and then we looked at these loss of function mutations here. So, so these two are subsets of the total exome variants here. And for the established 4AD genes, we didn't really see much in terms of association with AD of burden, right? But that kind of makes sense. You know, you have fully penetrant mutations in APPPS1. ApoE4 is almost fully penetrant. Um, maybe I would say it is fully penetrant if you live long enough, right? Um, but what we could see was that in the GWAS-confirmed genes, these aren't bad genes, we see a significant burden amongst the GWAS genes for exome SNPs. And even when you look at the deleterious ones, we see an excess burden of of, uh, of, of family-based associated G, uh, mutations in GWAS, and even just missing significance, 0.07 here, loss of function mutations that completely kill the gene. These are frame shifts or deletions of the gene. So if you then ask by category, these, these are the genes here of the AD genes. These are the AD genes that mainly drove that burden. So if you ask which genes carry the most rare mutations in clusters in patients that we're driving those, those, those p-values and results. This is the list, and in red, you can see the genes that are involved with innate immunity, innate immunity and inflammation, and by category, it's those genes involved with innate immunity and inflammation that contributed the most to burden for Alzheimer's disease. So this gives the importance of inflammation. So if you divvy up the, the genes for AD from various studies into those, those you suspect involve plaque pathology versus tangles, you can see that there's a growing number of, of genes in the innate immunity inflammation box. And one of these is TREM2. This was uh, published by DECODE a couple of years ago, and it was found that this mutation, R47H in TREM2, which when homozygous causes this Nasuokola disease, which is dementia with bone cysts, that the heterozygous state for this mutation confers risk for late onset AD. Um, now, this, these were the two original papers in New England Journal of Medicine, and then the question is, you know, is this replicated? What is the odds ratio? In the original papers, they claimed that TREM2, that mutation, had the same effect on risk as having an ApoE4 allele, which is, of course, you know, very high. It's, uh, it's, it's about, uh, about almost four as an odds ratio. Um, and we also asked, does TREM2 associate with other neurodegenerative disorders, FTLD, ALS, Parkinson's? And these are the answers. First of all, by meta-analysis, there's no doubt TREM2 is associated with AD. This is just showing a meta-analysis that we recently did with Lars Bertram. But you can also see that the final odds ratio is 2.7. So still pretty high, not four, like the original paper said, but 2.7 would still place it as the second highest odds ratio among late onset risk factors after ApoE4. When we looked in frontal temporal lobe I dementia, there was one positive study and that was positive enough that the overall p-value looks positive, but just note that all the subsequent studies are negative. So you have five negative studies, one positive. Meta-analysis shows a somewhat significant result, but really mild evidence for association, but really given that only one out of six studies was positive, you know, probably not nearly as strong association as with AD. And finally, for both Parkinson's and ALS, no association at all. The meta-analysis are negative. So there's a lot of speculation, TREM2, would show up as, a, as, an a, as an ALS and Parkinson's risk factor, but those meta-analysis with quite big data sets come up negative. So um, what does TREM2 do in the disease? Most of us believe that TREM2 keeps microglial cells clearing plaque and stops them from becoming inflammatory. So you think about microglial activation state, you got the more beneficial phagocytic side cleaning up debris, being neurotrophic. You got the other side of microglia, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, where they shoot out free radicals and cytokines. Um, now that's for resident microglia. But other studies by people like Ransehoff and, um, and even a recent study by Diego suggest that when you look at infiltrating macrophages that come into the brain and become microglia, here it looks like TREM2 positive microglia are bad. 
that they accumulate around plaques but don't clean them. So it looks like there's a big difference as to whether TREM2 is protective when you look at them on resident microglial cells, which is the majority of microglia in the brain, versus microglia that come from infiltrating macrophages. So that's why it, there's a bit of a debate about TREM2. There's less debate about CD33. CD33 is a gene that we described in 08, and then in 2009 and 2011, other um, uh, SNPs were shown in this uh, gene. One of these SNPs was shown to be protective. We had a paper in Neuron um, last year, or, or a year and a half ago, showing that that protective SNP in CD33 actually led to less CD33 on the microglial cell surface, and because of that, microglial cells cleared A beta more readily. So this was the model that here you have a microglial cell, and, um, and, and normally it's clearing X amount of amyloid, but when you have this protective variant, it led to a dramatically reduced amount of CD33 on the cell surface, and you've got much better clearance of amyloid. So we showed this in, in culture systems, clearance assays, and also in knockout mice in that paper. So I'm not going to show those data again. But, um, but basically, the idea was then that, is that CD33 is promoting more this phagocytic state of microglia versus this inflammatory state. So the question was, you know, can we show data for that? So in unpublished data, we asked, how does CD33 affect inflammation state? And I'll just show you one slide. And that is that if you look at the inflammatory microglial markers, we see that, that um, in knockouts for CD33, that you see the, the microglial inflammatory markers um, are now going down, whereas the protective markers go up. So that says that CD33 not only regulates the clearance of beta amyloid and phagocytosis, but it promotes the, the expression of these microglial markers associated with phagocytosis and protective rules of microglia and, and brings down significantly uh, markers like INOS and IL-1 beta that signifies microglia cells that are in the neuroinflammatory activated state. And that makes sense given this diagram that, that when they're phagocytic, they're not in this other state. CD33 basically takes them from the phagocytic state and makes them inflammatory. So if you want to keep microglial cells chilled out in the brain and protect your brain so your brain doesn't see a lot of plaque and tangle and freak out, and microglial cells are now creating free radicals and cytokines and activating astrocytes, you want to knock down CD33 and microglial cells based on these data. So, um, and, and again, this is just the paper I mentioned. I highly recommend it uh, by Teresa gomez Isla, uh, showing that in these brains where they're resilient to Alzheimer's disease, where there's lots of plaque and tangle, but these people die in their 80s with no disease, it's lack of inflammation that's the key. So I can just tell you as a preview, uh, unpublished data, and our whole genome sequencing of those brains, the protective mutations that we're finding that look, you know, we still have to verify them by, you know, in validation studies, but the candidates for protective novel mutations are showing up in TREM2. So we think that maybe TREM, we're looking at CD33 as well, but somehow these genes are protective from inflammation despite lots of cell death, plaques, and tangles. So this would be the idea then we're doing drug screens now to try to block CD33. Um, as a way to keep microglia more in this state, despite pathology. And then at WashU, we're working with David Holzman and Marco Colonna, who discovered TREM2, to find small molecules that turn on TREM2. So whether you turn on TREM2 or turn down CD33, um, you should keep microglial cells in this more phagocytic beneficial state. The question is, can you do that safely with regard to the rest of the innate immune system? But this is something we're doing quite actively now. Okay, so now I want to end um, with, um, again, with a hypothesis that, that like I said, uh, if, if, if I gained any credibility in, so far in my talk, it will all be lost in the next 10 minutes. But, but uh, I want to show you some data. It's an, it, I think it's intriguing. Um, it's, uh, it's a fringe hypothesis, but just recently you might have heard uh, about a study that found fungus in Alzheimer's brains versus control brains, this idea of infection. So let's call this the antimicrobial defense hypothesis, or just simply we could call it the infection hypothesis. And it begins with the question, is it possible that beta amyloid is not just junk, but plays a role in the brain? Okay, so I want to just, first of all, tell you about antimicrobial peptides. In the innate immune system, when you have an infection, before your adaptive immune system gets its act together and makes some antibodies and remembers that you saw this before, or that you have to make new antibodies, that takes days, a couple of days. You're, you would die if you don't have an innate immune system, which is your first line of defense. For example, LL37 is an innate immune antimicrobial peptide. 
is 37 amino acids long. Homozygotes for loss of L L37 don't live past two years old. You need innate immunity. <laughs> These are all the difference, different antimicrobial peptides used by the innate immune system, your first line of defense against infection. They fight bacteria, envelope viruses like herpes, virus, uh, herpes simplex virus 1. They fight fungus. They can even uh, fight transformed or cancerous cells. Typically, antimicrobial peptides are 12 to 50 amino acids long. A beta is about 40 amino acids long. They're charged peptides. They take on a alpha helical and beta sheet combination, A beta. And many AMP-derived amyloids are found. There are at least three amyloid doses, lactoferrin and, and seminal vesicle amyloid and aortic medial amyloid. In all cases, these antimicrobial peptides fight bacteria by forming an amyloid around them. So it's not too big a stretch to think about another amyloid in the, in the body, beta amyloid, as a possible antimicrobial peptide. So back in 2010, we had a graduate student who did this work. We published this in PLOS One. We didn't think it would get a lot of attention, um, but then Gina Collada wrote a, wrote a New York Times story and Science Times about it, and I had colleagues writing me saying, Rudy, why are you hyping up a paper in PLOS One? And I said, I didn't do it. It was, you know, they, they picked up on this. But, but nothing wrong with PLOS One. Um, but basically, what we found was that when we tested A beta 42 or A beta 40, up against LL37 as a control and penicillin against a host of different clinical pathogens. The smaller the number here, the more effective the peptide is in fighting that pathogen. So you can see that A beta is very, very pro potent, the most potent against candida albicans, yeast or fungus. Pretty good effects against E. coli, against staph epidermis, and this just shows you the, the relative effects of penicillin for those that were tested here. So all this says that compared to LL37 in this paper, using just straight microbiology assays, A-beta is a pretty potent antimicrobial peptide. Then what we did was we took AD brain temporal cortex, where there's lots of amyloid, versus cerebellum. This is non-AD, oops, this is non-AD in gray. This is AD in pink, temporal cortex. And we could see that brain homogenous full of amyloid actively killed C, uh, candida albicans, yeast. Whereas in cerebellum, where there was no amyloid, you got no um, beneficial effect. Then if we took an antibody, an immunodepleted A-beta from the uh, brain sample, we saw that we lost that protective effect. Again, suggesting, I'm watching the real clock. I know my time was, was, was short, but let me finish. So, <laughs> I'm not going to go into a full debate after my talk anymore. Um, so, that combined with this, I'm almost done. Um, with that combined with this paper that um, that brain regions are affected with, with fungus and Alzheimer's disease, that fungal bodies and hyphae of various candidate species were found in AD brains, suggest that perhaps this is what A-beta's role is. A-beta is to fight infection in the brain. So I want to call this the infection hypothesis. This is the summary of four different studies that are in one paper in press where we used either neurons, C. elegans, Drosophila, or mice, all of which were infected with various clinical pathogens, either yeast, or salmonella, and in each case, when these organisms expressed amyloid, they were protected against infection quite readily. But the way it works is very simple. The A-beta first prevents adhesion to the cell, then it agglutinates the yeast, and then it forms an amyloid fibro trap around yeast. This is not new for antimicrobial peptides. Antimic antimicrobial peptides are already known to form nanonets, like defensins, around bugs. This is what amyloid's doing. So can we see direct evidence of that? So this, oh boy. You're, did you do that? I have to show, I'm sorry, I have to show this slide because it's the coolest slide I ever had in my life. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to show this slide if I can find it. Hold on. No, 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 it's almost done. It's like, it's very, very few slides. There's like two slides left. But you've got to see this because it's crazy data. And I'm not sure why this is happening. But I will find that slide. Okay, so uh, I'll skip ahead. That just shows quickly. Okay, this just shows that for a lot of different bugs, you get amyloid fibers going, herpes simplex virus 1, salmonella, et cetera, that this is how a classic antimicrobial peptide works. But this is the cool slide. Okay, so what we did here, we took an Alzheimer's mouse that's four weeks old, 5XFAD mouse. At four weeks old, these mice have no amyloid. They don't get amyloid till about eight months old, okay? What you're seeing here, this is a control mouse. 
Those red dots are salmonella. We have red fluorescent stained salmonella. We're injecting stereotactically into the hippocampus. You're seeing salmonella grow in the brain. That mouse dies in about one day. With amyloid present, they last longer. That's what I showed on the last slide. Now, take salmonella that's heat killed, inject it into an Alzheimer's mouse, you see nothing. There's no amyloid in green. There's no salmonella because it's heat killed bacteria as a control. But now, take that four week old mouse where there's no amyloid at that age. Again, not till it's eight months old, you have amyloid. Inject salmonella, here they are in red, wait 48 hours, and that's how much amyloid plaque you have. So, eight months to get amyloid in the mouse? No. Not if you inject bacteria overnight, just about. And if you look here, see those little yellow spots? That's green is the plaque, and every plaque has one single bug in it, which is how antimicrobial peptides work. They form plaques around a bug. So if you want amyloid really fast, have just a little bit of bacteria or yeast in your brain. You don't need a lot. You don't need to have meningitis, encephalitis, or symptomatic infection. It's enough to have one bug to get a plaque in this study. So this is a new hypothesis. This just shows a, I'm not going to show it, it's a 3D thing showing the plaque with the salmonella. This is the, the mechanism, anti-adhesion, agglutination, entrapment that forms the plaque. And so this would say then in this infection hypothesis that amyloid can be seeded by pathogens rapidly and that perhaps amyloid is playing a role in the innate immune system. And isn't it coincidental that during inflammation, microglial cells also stop clearing amyloid to let it build up? They're not phagocytic anymore. So that's just, I'll just end uh, with this slide that maybe with age, as we have silent infection, I'll call it in the brain, this could be due to periodontal disease, nasal bacteria, gut dysbiosis, maybe even a UTI, impaired immunity with age, compromised blood brain barrier. Soon you have these subacute asymptomatic um, brain infections that are unnoticed. This causes rapid A beta seeding, inflammation, microglial um, phagocytosis is down. If you believe Alzheimer's in a dish, Excess amyloid leads to tangle formation and spreading, neuronal dysfunction, more neuroinflammation. And some of the pathogens that are candidates based on the literature, chlamydia pneumoniae, herpes simplex virus 1, HSV6, candida, and Borrelia. So, and just to show one more thing, the newest Alzheimer's genes we found using insertion deletions are all adaptive immunity genes. So maybe even adaptive immunity by being compromised at the AD level is contributing to this. I'll skip all these conclusions. And Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. <laughs> so I'll stop there and let me tell you. <laughs> and, and I'm out of breath. <laughs> Thank you for a, a truly fascinating um, lecture. I'm sure there are many questions, one here, one here. We, I, we must have time for some questions, so please. A uh, quick question. Christina Alberini, New York. Um, if you treat normal mice with anti-A beta treatments, do they become immunodeficient? Yeah, so what we did was we, we, we actually used an APP knockout mouse. And in fact, that's why the paper is not coming out in nature. Is we, the pa this paper I just showed, all these results of the paper, it was in nature for six months, three revisions. And in the end, because we, when we did the APP knockouts, we had a trend toward them being more susceptible to, to infection, but not significance. And the thing is, as we try to argue to them, you know, there's incredible redundancy in the innate immune system. You can't, you can't fool around with it. So we were seeing other innate immune peptides like LR37 and defensins going up in the APP knockout mice. So they had some susceptibility, but it wasn't significant. So I think, on one hand, you can overexpress A beta and see the gain of protection. But if you knock out APP, you get some reduction in susceptibility, but the redundancy, I think, it doesn't let you see the whole thing. And that's why it's coming out in science, translational medicine, and not in nature. Um, Adam Drunowski, Nutrition Council. Um, Yogi Berra also said, it's hard to predict anything, and especially the future. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Um, does low socioeconomic status predict future Alzheimer's, and to what extent? In humans, not mice, obviously. Well, it's not my area of, 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 of expertise, but there are studies that suggest that, for sure. And I think we now to start, need to start thinking not only about aspects of education, but aspects of hygiene. Because the, the most, probably the, the biggest source of chronic infection and inflammation in the body is your, your gums. Um, I'm taking much better 
care of my teeth now that I saw these data, by the way. But we're also going to think about, about gut, gut microbiome, about diet, how are we affecting bugs in the brain. I mean, this is all uncharted territory. We're actually doing an experiment now, study now, where we're cataloging the microbiome of the brain because it's small amounts of, you have to do RNA-seq to do it, it's very small amounts, but from normal, young, healthy young to healthy old to Alzheimer's, is there a change in the microbiome of the brain that could explain some of these uh, results in the last uh, part of the talk? Rudy, this is cool stuff. How, how do you explain the, the phenomena that you talked about earlier, which is um, you can find people that have loads of plaques and tangles, mm -hmm. and the only reason they don't have, at least your theory is the only reason they don't have Alzheimer's disease is because there's no inflammation. Yeah. So how does that fit with them? I mean, why did they have a bacterial why infection? Did, why did they have? Why did they have loads of plaques? Because they cleaned their teeth. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't and, know. and 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 uh, essentially. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. So these rare people where you see, I mean, they're pretty rare. We we found 16 brains around the country um, that had high plaque levels, or in some cases, BRAC stage five or six tangles, and they died in the 80s without dementia, and there was no inflammation. I would guess if they were living, you know, several hundred or a thousand years ago, they might not have survived because maybe their brain might have had less ability to fight an infection because their microglial cells were less likely because of the mutations to go to that neuroinflammatory state. But in today's society, the way we live, they probably just weren't challenged. I'm just, I mean, that's all, or they had a good adaptive immune system. Yeah. Or clean their teeth. Okay. Rudy, I was wondering, yeah. the infection hypothesis predicts that drugs that reduce A beta could increase the consequences of neural infections. Mm -hmm. So some of the drugs you talked about, yeah. the rest of your talk might be dangerous. Yeah, so I skipped past that slide in just a time, but basically what I'm saying is, if you're using these amyloid drugs, dial it down like you do cholesterol, but don't wipe it out. And God knows, don't do an active vaccination because you can't control that afterwards. So if you're going to use beta secretase inhibitors or gamma secretase inhibitors, maybe passive immunization, but active vaccination is probably not a good idea. Yeah. I'm not sure who was next. There's one here and then one here. So for the trial of the secretase, are they, you need to, the, your conclusion was they have to have preclinical diagnosis, right? I, I mean, you have to start early. Yes. So, um, are you using your genetic loci to uh, um, stratify patients or what? Or, or yeah. you could just give it to everybody. Well, well, to be honest, I mean, up till now, we've had the three early onset genes, which is a tiny you know, fraction of a percent of AD. You have ApoE4, which is highly predictive, but you need the rest of these genes together with it. GWAS only gave us the genes. We're only transitioning now into the whole genome sequencing. So I'm going to be publishing with that whole genome paper, you know, just tons of Excel sheets of the variants that we found in those genes, including the ones that were associated with AD, um, and then maybe some of those at some point will be on the chip altogether, where you would test for maybe 100, 200, or even 1,000 functional variants and empirically determine which ones, you know, determine risk. But that's still a work in progress before we're at that point. It's just the beginning. But then isn't it too early to do the beta secretase? No, 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 because you can, you can, if you, Picture you go to the doc after 40 years old, you get an Amy Vid stain for amyloid, you look in your sp and, it, and it's high, you do a spinal tap, your phospho tau is high, or maybe the Nestle's blood test for tau is even easier once that comes online. And, um, and then you say, look, you're in the 70th percentile for your age for how much plaque you have in Tangle. We can't tell you you're going to get Alzheimer's for sure, but you're at risk. Just like my cardiologist says, you have a family history of heart disease, you have high cholesterol, I'm taking Lipitor. So if you have a safe drug, like, that, that you can take to bring your amyloid down, and you know your amyloid's high, and you have the biomarkers already there, why not do it? So you do, maybe start doing that after 40 years old in the future. That's just a possibility. Going back to the, the three-dimensional tissue culture, I just had a question regarding... Uh, Wait, where, where are you? Where are you? Oh, okay, here. good, thanks. James Kozlowski, IBM Research. I just wanted to ask if the activity patterns you observed as abnormal in the three-dimensional tissue culture uh, occurred uh, before the plaques emerged. It looked like you were looking very early in the culture, and since we're considering yeah. upstream yes. hypotheses for, yeah, for yeah, causation, yeah. could the dynamics be mm -hmm. uh, playing a role in plaque formation? And yes. have you looked at very early tissue cultures before any plaques are formed to see if there are differences? Yeah, so that's a great question, and we have to do more timeline on that. But at three weeks old, 
of the couches, that's when you start seeing the firing is down. At that point, you don't have plaques, you have abator oligomers, a lot of them, and you're also starting to see phospho tau detergent resistant oligomers, but no plaques and tangles yet, but that's when you start seeing dysfunction. Yes. Okay. okay. Well, I think, I wish we had far more time for further questions, but there will be dinner as well, so thank okay. you very, okay. very much Thanks. for, for your presentation. You. Now in the program we have a short break, uh, perhaps slightly shorter than, um, so let's have 10 minutes break and be back here by a quarter past if that's okay.
So, um, now I think everyone has come back, strengthened from a short but I hope efficient break. And I'm very pleased to um, uh, introduce Deep Dixit, who will give the last lecture for the day. All right. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> and <laughs> Because I thought that maybe you guys would think that this is this, there's too much immune in this, and maybe nobody's going to show up. And and I must say that I'm neither a nutritionist and nor a neuroscientist. And just like Rebecca Sachs was saying that she was surprised, I'm also extremely surprised and actually flattered that I'm here among uh, all you people to talk about some of the work that we're doing. Uh, and so obviously I have to thank uh, Johannes and, and the organizers for inviting me here. It's my first time here, and it's, it's wonderful. So when I I heard the first uh, talk in this session, I was actually really intimidated because we are very simple-minded people and we do simple experiments. And luckily, uh, Dr. Tanzi's talk kind of, you know, pepped me up a little bit that, in fact, innate system... <laughs> 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 exactly. <laughs> that, in fact, innate immune system is, is, is actually not too far away, and we really need innate immunity, in fact. Uh, and that's the, the, the theme that we're going to discuss, and which brings back uh, you know, uh, this question that uh, my colleague Tomas Horvat, that uh, Tomas, other Tomas knows very well, and he always says that, yes, neurons' uh, brain controls uh, the body, but in fact, body is very critical in controlling brain, too. So I think this would uh, touch a little bit upon uh, uh, those those issues. So I'll <clears throat> I, I will not belabor this point because I think this is pretty clear to all of you that uh, there is indeed a silver tsunami coming globally, and uh, with that of course there are uh, lots of us that are now living longer, and and there are more of us that are going to be living longer. And this is a worldwide phenomenon. So by 2050, you can see the predictions right here in both developing as well as develop, uh, uh, developed countries. And if there are any Japanese uh, females in the audience, uh, you can see that they, they have uh, the best odds of uh, living longer. And, and what is pretty stunning, and I found this, this is actually from the Congressional Budget Office in US, which was a very kind of a you know, negative kind of a statement that every year of life expectancy costs US Social Security approximately 50 billion. <laughs> So, I mean, that's pretty sad, right? I mean, that, that you would think about this in a totally in a, in a economic perspective. That's not the only reason we should care about aging, be, because that's, that we're going to be a burden on the society. But in fact, these questions are not new. And, uh, and that's, this really brings me to the innate immunity. And I think those of you who are interested in immunology and, and, and philosophy of science would recognize this guy, Ilya Mechnikov. So of course, he was the guy who discovered phagocytes and macrophages and, and here, in, uh, not very far from here in Pasteur Institute. And he is, uh, got the Nobel Prize, but, uh, uh, but unlike um, others, I mean, he was really the founder of innate immunity. So this guy founded innate immunity. And, uh, and he wrote this <clears throat> rather controversial book uh, at that point of time. And if, uh, uh, if you guys have not read it, I urge you to read it. It's actually quite interesting. And, and he was talking about a prolongation of life. But many of you probably will not know that uh, Ilya Mechnikov also was one of the first guys who discovered and coined the term gerontology. And he said that aging is like any other science which can be studied by exact method. Uh, and so in this book, he talks about uh, uh, aging and prolongation of life. And, and in fact, he was, you could call him also the, one of the first nutritionists who was interested in immunology, of course, with some con controversial ideas that lactobacillus and, Bulga and, and Bulgarian yogurt extends lifespan and all that. And those experiments, of course, didn't work out, at least with the ends that he was proposing. But anyways, there was some very interesting statements he made, uh, which are, in fact, coming true now as, you know, in 2015 that he made so many years ago. He got a lot of things right. And one of the things he said was that the phagocytes, or macrophages, in fact are critical to the biology of aging, that these are the cells that are critical for this. And of course, you could say that, oh, maybe just because he discovered it, so it's like, you know, he's too biased for it. But in fact, I'll show you some data that would suggest that this, what Ilya Meshnikov predicted, could in fact be too true. And then, of course, he made this, uh, this prediction that, that the victories against an infectious disease would benefit youth only to reveal biomedicine's helplessness. Now, you can read this much better than my Indian accent, right? And, and this is, in fact, was also very controversial in those days, because people didn't want to believe this. This, this, can, this can actually happen. And in fact, he's, he's absolutely right. And as, uh, as Rudy Tanzi and others have already shown you, that as we're getting older, 
the biggest incidence and, and the biggest burden is really the chronic diseases. And in fact, the same degenerated diseases that Ilya predicted, that we're going to live long and that's what we're going to have. And it's the infections that we have actually done much better with. So you can see that these are the, uh, these are the data from Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. And you can see it's a majority of these, these chronic diseases. Um, and, and Alzheimer's, of course, is, is, uh, is, is a big one there. Right? So this, this kind of brings this, this question uh, in, in the field of aging, and of course, uh, which is rather interesting, is that, in fact, if you look at a lot of these chronic diseases, of course, this is not to the scale, uh, it's just a schematic representation, that many of these chronic diseases, uh, of course, sinusitis is not one of them, in this case, age-related, but uh, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or, uh, Alzheimer's, all these diseases are really age-related, okay? So what this means is that, in fact, age is, in fact, the biggest risk factor for chronic diseases. And the argument, uh, uh, or the philosophical argument in the field by some has been that, you know, the biomedical enterprise basically tackles each of these diseases individually. So we spend billions of dollars on heart disease and billions on cancer and, and all that. And, uh, and some people in the field would like to argue or would like to state that is there something intrinsic in the biology of aging that leads to this onset of so many of these chronic diseases. And if we indeed understand that, is there a way for us to in fact tackle all of them in one go? Of course, it's a, it's a big task, and we all know how Paul Ehrlich's uh, magic bullet theory went, so, so we have to all be skeptical about these things. But that's one of the questions in the field. And, and obviously, I mean, it's very simple to know here that almost every one of these chronic diseases has an inflammatory component, right? So all of you guys know this is basically what happens, that you know, with aging there is this chronic inflammation. And, and there is a lot of association between this chronic inflammation, uh, several of these diseases, and the functional decline and reduction in the health span that we see. And um, in fact, there are the, the causal data between here and here is actually much less, as, as many of you who are in pharmaceutical industry would know that we, our, most of our anti-inflammatories uh, don't really work in, in, in several of these chronic diseases in terms of their efficacy. So obviously, there's a lot more going on. But what we are interested in is to understand how this chronic in inflammation is, is happening in, 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 in aging and in other diseases where there is no overt infection. And obviously, this involves interplay of these, several of these things. The potentially, there is metabolic disbalance where there are emergence of what is so-called danger signals. That was a word coined by uh, Pauli Matzinger. And these include lipotoxic moieties, uh, cholesterol, uric acid, lipid by peroxidation byproducts. And of course, these things can emerge from mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, these things can also emerge from altered gut microbiota, which is going to be from your, from your body that could impact your brain. And of course, there are infections. There are latent infections. And those, those latent infections can, in fact, also lead to, uh, to inflammation. And then, you know, when this, uh, this, the, the people discuss inflammation, of course, inflammation in aging is actually very different than the classical signs of inflammation. I mean, most of you are already aware of it. We don't see this type of classical inflammatory responses that happen uh, in, in, a, in a normal uh, response to infection. So what's actually going on? This is a very simple schematic, which is based on really Charlie Janeway's uh, hypothesis that really was developed by Ruslan Medzitov in our department, which is that to have to have, if you have to go to have inflammation, you're going to have uh, these so-called danger signals or DAMPs, uh, damage-associated molecular patterns. So these are normally, uh, in case of immune system, mainly microbes, uh, but they can also be sterile uh, factors. There are factors, sterile means that they're non-bacterial origin, and these are things like urid crystals, which we know that cause cause gout. Uh, we heard about amyloid. There are also um, mitochondrial damage uh, that can be induced because of endosymbionts and, and there are lipotoxic fatty acids. So when these danger signals are present, of course, they have to be sensed by something. And innate immune system's job is, the first job, is to sense these, these, these damage uh, signals and try to repair it, in fact. It's maintenance of homeostasis. And, and these pattern recognition receptors you guys know a whole lot about toll-like receptors um, and the rig-like receptors, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about nod-like receptors or the inflammasomes uh, in the course of time. And then, of course, there are sensors like antigen receptors, TCRs and BCRs for adaptive immunity. We're not going to discuss that today. But when these sensors sense these damage or danger signals, well, then you get the release of these effectors. And these mainly come from, a majority of them, from lymphoid or uh, lineage cells. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the regulation of these two major effector cytokines, IL-18 and IL-18. IL-1 beta. 
So it's, it, it's great to be in Lausanne, and, and I must say that I'm a huge fan of uh, Jörg Chop, late Jörg Chop, and whose seminal work really led to discovery of this complex, and it, it was a huge loss to the field of his untimely passing away. But Jörg Chop was really the guy who uh, established the NLRP3 and several of these NLR inflammasome area. So this is basically a schematic from one of uh, Jörg's uh, 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 review. So um, here, but basically it shows, so the NLRs, or these Nord-like receptors, these sensors, it's a very big family. And it took a while for these NLRs to come, uh, to be recognized, because they're actually absent in, 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 in C. elegans and Drosophila, so which means most of you actually have it. Uh, I think most of you. <laughs> so, but, but that is, so I will talk to you mainly about the NLRP3, because that's one that we know a whole lot about, okay? So, <clears throat> So based on work from uh, Jörg Chop, in fact, my cousin Vishwa Dixit, uh, uh, Luke O'Neill, and several giants in the field, we know a whole lot about the activation of this complex, which is that this complex is composed of primarily three proteins, NLRP3, also called NALP3. It has an adapter called as ASC, and of course, the procaspase 1 zymogen. So the way this protein functions is that it needs to, it's, it's type of a molecular Velcro, and it assembles by this uh, uh, pyrene pyrene interaction with the ASC protein, and this ASC protein has a caspase activation recruitment domain, which allows the interaction with this pro-caspase 1 zymogen. And once this molecular Velcro is assembled, based on the sensing that is done by this, uh, by this uh, protein, it causes uh, the, the activation of this uh, inactive cysteine protease into active cysteine pro uh, uh, caspase 1. And then this caspase 1 basically controls the post-translational processing of these two key molecules, IL-1-beta and IL-18. And we heard a little bit about IL-1-beta from Rudy's talk in one of these uh, uh, CD33 knockouts, how IL-1-beta is also regulated in Alzheimer's disease, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So <clears throat> basically, this inflammasome is actually very unique. It's very, very unique in the sense that it can sense very broad type of the so-called damage or danger signals, which are structurally not related. So for example, uh, amyloids, uh, uret crystals, uh, they're obviously very different from fatty acid ceramides and free cholesterol, which we have shown to activate the inflammasome. And, and it, of course, inflammasome uh, also senses microbial pathogen-associated molecular patterns. That's the reason why it is there. And, and the consequences that there is activation of this caspase 1, there is a non-canonical caspase 11. I don't have much time, but most, mostly negative data that I don't have time to show you, but we can discuss later if you have questions. And the point of this slide is that this activation of this caspase 1, which can in, in fact have multiple substrates, controls the, the, uh, in fact the death of cells and also the secretion of these two key pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what am I talking about with inflammasome activation? So uh, these are data from macrophages, and it's a readout of inflammasome activation, which is the activation of this caspase 1 pro, uh, cysteine uh, uh, protease. So uh, caspase 1 is kept in a cell, in a myeloid lineage cell, so it is uh, most, uh, uh, almost all macrophages um, and microglia. So here, this is the inactive caspase. When you provide, and this, for the activation, you require two signals. Um, in this case, the first signal is TLR4 activation, and it does not cause the activation of the inflammasome. So this is the active uh, caspase 1. And when you provide the second signal, in this case, extracellular ATP, which comes from a lot of dead cells, what you get is the cleavage of this activation. Uh, and then monosodium urate, ceramide, tunicomycin, palmitate, all these things, in fact, all these damps increase with age, and many of them increase, uh, at least several of those lipotoxic fatty acids increase with age uh, in, in the brain itself. And when you do not have an LRP3, this activation is basically not there. So it's a very specific pathway. So, so we looked into this uh, in, 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 in the effort to understand what are the mechanisms of age-related inflammation and can we understand whether the inf inflammasome is one of the regulators and which inflammasome is the major one. So here, <clears throat> what you're looking at is IL-18, which is one of the cytokines that require cleavage of IL-1-beta. Uh, it's easily measurable. IL-1-beta is not easily measurable in the serum in, in, in clean animals. So here are uh, uh, levels of IL-1-beta with age. So these are 23-month-old wild-type animals. They're all black six. And you can see this uh, increases substantially with age. If you remove uh, NLRP3, this is, this is reduced. And if you remove the adapter, ASC, uh, this is pretty much non-existent. So it means there are probably other inflammasomes that are involved in this process. And then there is this non-canonical inflammasome, caspase 11, which actually can sense LPS independently of toll-like receptor 4. So it was a lot of work, but mainly negative data that the non-canonical inflammasome in this case is not required. Okay. So these animals are protected from age-related inflammation. They also have improvement in glucose homeostasis. So with aging, with inflammation, these animals become insulin resistant, so as do people. And you can, these are the glucose excursion curves. Uh, 
in the wild type animal and the NLRP3 knockout animals that are about 23 months old in normal diet. So uh, this is what's happening in the periphery. And so, uh, and like I said, we, I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist, but we were really challenged by my colleagues in the aging field. And he said that if, there are, if, if you're interested in inflammation, if inflammation is really that important, you have to look into the brain. So after a lot of prodding and resistance, we in fact did look into the brain, and this is the data uh, from hippocampus. So, so this is pro-caspase 1 in young and old and old NLRP3 knockout animals, and this is the active caspase. As you can clearly see that with aging, there is an increase in the activation of the inflammasome in the hippocampus, and in the absence of NLRP3, this is substantially reduced. This is just the, uh, the, the, the quantitations of uh, uh, caspase 1 and IL-1 beta, which is uh, the major cytokine that is regulated by this inflammasome complex. So, so we looked into this uh, to the, in, in the hippocampus uh, uh, with the help of Heike Munzberg, one of my colleagues, in, uh, my former colleagues in, in Pennington, uh, who studies uh, brain, and, and she did these stainings. And what you can look at is basically estrogliosis, because that was one of the things that we wanted to look at, what happens with age. Uh, so this is wild-type aged animals uh, with GFAP staining. And here are the uh, NLRP3 knockouts. So these animals have much lower uh, astrogliosis with age. So these are all normal animals. They are, uh, they're all black sick, so they, they obviously do not develop uh, tangles and plaques like, uh, like the other Alzheimer's models. So this is normal uh, aging, which, is, which we think is important in this context. And uh, I would not, ha uh, uh, the, the, the basic premise of this is that uh, the absence of NLRP3 and ASC in the hippocampus as well as cortex, there is a reduction in this key pro-inflammatory cytokine with age. So the question is to, okay, how do you actually assess what's, what's going on in, in these mice? I mean, uh, people are a little bit easier, uh, but we still have to work with animal models for this early discovery type of work. And this slide is from one of my colleagues, Don Ingram, who in fact developed this stone teammates, and he always uh, has, has really pushed this idea that if you have to study cognition in mice, uh, you have to really look at the right test. Because if you use a Morris water maze for older animals, majority of the black six mice have cataracts and they actually are blind. So, so you're really not measuring cognitive function, you're just looking at blindness. So, um, so, so what he's done is he's developed this uh, very in interesting uh, maze uh, where mice are basically uh, have to reach this goal box. I'll show you the video. Uh, and there's just enough water so that because the mice just need a little bit of push to actually waddle through it, otherwise they, they will not move. So. Um, let me see if, how this works. So the point of this slide is that the NLRP3 animals have, uh, the knockouts have substantially improved cognitive function. And you can see the task these, these wild type animals are performing. So this guy has to come all the way. He has to find his way to get to the goal box. Um, and here is, I believe, here is the knockout. I, if I've labeled it right, but you'll find out. So, so, so these animals are, uh, so they make errors. And you can quantify those errors. So this guy is fast. So he's, he's there. Um, and that's probably more like me. I mean, I think I'm, I'm spatially totally challenged, so. <laughs> but uh, the point of this, the, this, uh, these, these mazes is that, especially with the stone maze, you can actually uh, count these errors and, and really quantify what's going on. So here is the data. So this was all done blinded at cohort level by Don Ingram and Paul Pistel, my colleagues. Uh, and this is from 18-month-old animals, and these are from 24-month animals. So these mice, uh, so you can count their errors. These are uh, different trials. So you give them trials, and there's a number of errors they make. So they're not born smart, but uh, you know the old wild-type animals make more errors. They, uh, they learn slowly. But the NLRP3 knockouts, they make much fewer errors, and they learn faster in, in, in making these errors, so suggesting that they have improvements in cognitive function. So when we published this data uh, just about the same time from Ike Lutz, uh, group and, and Doug, Bolling, uh, Doug Gollenbach and, and UMass, and Ike Lutz is now here now in Bonn, that they also showed that, uh, that the NLRP3 is in fact activated in the Alzheimer's disease. And this is just the data uh, from humans where they show that uh, in, in people uh, with Alzheimer's, the, uh, as you can see in Alzheimer's uh, uh, disease uh, patients, there is increase in caspase 1 activation that uh, what we basically see in the hippocampus of aging animals. And, and they, they basically knocked out NLRP3 from this uh, APP 
um, a PS model um, and, and showed that these animals have improvement in cognitive function. So indeed, it seems to be playing an important role as far as uh, uh, cognitive decline is concerned. So since I'm not a neuroscientist and we really didn't know what to do rather than look into each gene, so we decided to do the transcriptomic analysis, uh, and, and which was pretty stunning actually what we found, which is that, I, 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 that in, because you know, NLRP3 uh, uh, inflammasome is mainly required in post-translational processing, you would not really expect a huge changes in the transcriptome, but there are major changes in transcriptome because the, of the cytokines that are secreted. And so here, uh, typically immunologists don't do these experiments because we like to sort out each cell. This is whole hippocampus, and I think that's why data are kind of interesting because we're capturing everything. So what you're looking at is a down-regulated with age in, in, in green and red in, in uh, up-regulated. And these are reciprocally down-regulated or regulated in both aged NLRP3 and the ASK knockout. So remember, ASK is the, uh, the adapter. And there has been controversy in the field regards to uh, how critical is ASK because it could have function outside of the inflammasome. It's, so it's important to kind of decipher that. And it's pretty clear to see that there are major changes, of course, in hippocampal transcriptome. And what's also stunning is that both NLRP3 and ASC regulate majority of these, these, these targets. And, and if you look into it a little bit more detail, uh, so here in blue is gene expression comparing young versus old. So about 186 go up, 122 go down. And then, uh, so this is uh, comparing wild type old animals with NLRP3 in this red, and then comparing the old wild type animals with the ASK knockout in brownish. <laughs> Anyway, the point of this slide is that the genes in this case uh, in the aging hippocampus, 176 of them, they are reciprocally uh, regulated by both in both the genotypes, okay? So, and you can see only few genes, actually mainly only three that are not regulated by NLRP3 and, and ASC. So both of these um, uh, strains, uh, our, uh, NLRP3 as well as the adapter ASC, uh, regulate the, uh, um, the, the transcriptome in the hippocampus. And most of these changes are, are related to the inflammatory pathway. And it was, so it was very nice to hear what uh, Rudy Tanzi said, that inflammation is the key, which is, in fact, true. So <laughs> it's nice to hear that. Uh, and, and, and we are coming in the field as agnostics. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a hippocampus uh, uh, neurodegenerative expert from any angle. So. So one of the things that we were very excited to find in this, was, which was very interesting, was activation of the complement pathway. So complement is, you know, is, is one of those classical innate immune uh, uh, regulators, which is critical for, for innate immunity, defense against pathogens. And, and it was quite stunning to find the high amount of complement in the brain. And this is, is, is uh, quite highly upregulated with age. And in the NLRP3 knockouts, almost all of these, uh, these complement activation pathways are, are down-regulated uh, in the knockouts. And of course, there's no effect with the caspase 11. So I would summarize without showing you all the data as to, as to what we think is going on as far as at least aging and inflammation is concerned and what is the role of this particular innate immune sensor, which is in fact act activated all over the body throughout wherever there is a myeloid lineage cell, be it your bone, an osteoclast, be it the adipose tissue macrophage, uh, or be it a microglia. So what happens is that with aging, what we get is this damage and this increase in several of these so-called danger signals. And the NLRP3 inflammasome in this case is very relevant because this is the only inflammasome which can sense in fact all of them. All right? That's why we're finding these remarkable effects in these animals. And so the way it goes through is there's a canonical pathway. Basically, what happens in this case is that this inflammasome is activated by these, these uh, different uh, danger signals, and then you get this uh, in complex to be assembled, and the active caspase one then cleaves IL-1 beta and IL-18, and this, call, this leads to what is so-called inflammaging, coined, a term coined by Claudio Franceschi. But the point of this is that this inflammation, in fact, uh, in these animals, if we ablate this pathway, um, that it leads, it actually protects against not only these, all these different things, bone loss, adipose tissue inflammation, in fact, thymic involution, nobody here perhaps care about it except maybe double. Uh, but um, this is actually a very remarkable phenotype in these animals. But the main thing that probably you guys are concerned with is that they are protected from CNS inflammation at the, and the action is really in the microglia. <laughs> And only some of these effects are IL-1 beta dependent, so which is also important because there are uh, monoclonal antibodies and they're uh, against IL-1 beta, um, and not all the effects here are actually mediated by IL-1 beta, okay? So <clears throat> this really raises the question, 
Let me just quickly summarize that this is what basically what we are finding is that NLRP3 inflammasome is, is important in aging and in hippocampus by it regulates astrogliosis and it is one of the key regulators of innate immune activation in the brain. And so that, that if you reduce NLRP3 inflammasome, you can uh, prevent the age-related increase in complement and also interferon pathway. I didn't show you all the data from that. And we, therefore, we think that lowering this aberrant inflammasome activation is perhaps a good, one of the strategies that should be pursued. So that really brings the question um, as to what, is, what are the endogenous regulators of, uh, of, the, of this uh, inflammasome. And this was partly uh, um, questioned by uh, one of the um, colleagues here that what's happening in people that have plaques? And uh, even though a beta causes um, all these things with innate immune activation, in those people, they're protected, there's no inflammation. So there must be something going on where the inflammasome is deactivated despite the presence of those dams, and that is homeostasis. And that are those metabolic inputs. So we are very interested in, in, in identifying, the one, uh, identifying what those are. So that really brings me to this, this thing that I have been interested in since my postdoctoral time at the NIH, which is the adaptive starvation response, okay? So several of the, you guys who, who study nutrition would immediately recognize this, is because if you're in negative energy balance and you're calorie restricted, of course you, you, know, you actually get lifespan extension and maintenance of homeostasis. And what we are interested in, we also know that you know, this leads to uh, reduction in inflammation in, uh, in, uh, in, in several models. And what we're trying to understand is, when you elicit this adaptive starvation response, it's not just less calories. At that point of time, host has to maintain homeostasis. And, and we are interested to know what are those factors, endogenous factors, that are elicited by this intervention that we can harness. So there are experiments one can do to understand the basic biology of aging by looking into these type of intervention and finding out potential new targets that we could use to, to restrain uh, things that cause damage or that cause inflammation. So, so this was, I, I don't have a whole lot of time to go into this, but this is a study that was ongoing for the last 10 years uh, called Calorie Comprehensive, uh, it's a long acronym. Basically a study that was funded by National Institute on Aging, a multi-center trial, to look into the effects of calorie restriction in people. It was a two-year trial where people were calorie restricted for to, supposed to be 25%, they all managed only about 14%. And, and the reason why I'm showing you this data is the data are actually stunning, and this is all unreported. It should be, we'll be publishing this next year. Um, and hopefully, <laughs> these, these days you never know when it takes, how long it takes to get published. But um, what, what basically what we're looking at here is that in people, we were actually able to get adipose tissue biopsies of these people. And you're looking at uh, people at baseline year one and year two. These are participants in each, each lane, and we did the RNA sequencings. And you can see that calorie restriction in this case has a massive response at, in the adipose tissue. And, and majority of this response in the periphery is, is all related to inflammatory uh, regulators, majority of them, and of course, metabolism. And one of the things that, that struck us from that, that, that thing was this elevation in the ketone metabolism that was identified from these, from these studies. So that led us to ask the question, what are the endogenous, what are these endogenous uh, metabolites or regulators that are elicited by this uh, intervention that we could potentially harness, that, that crosstalks, that, the, the crosstalk between metabolism and immunity, what can we learn from it? So again, so, so adaptive starvation response is not just less calories. You do this, you, one of the things that happens is you get an increase in FGF21, and many of you guys already know this, that, uh, that FGF21, so if you overexpress it, enhances lifespan in, in mice by close to 45%, so it's a pro-longevity hormone. And the way, uh, among the things that it does is that when your glycogen reserves are depleted in this condition, you have to utilize all the fats that you have accumulated. And that is leading to increased lipid utilization and then uh, ketone body production. And as you guys know better than I do, that many of these long chain fatty acids do not cross blood brain barrier. So during adaptive starvation response, the way evolution has designed it is basically ketones that are the ones that are running the brain, right? So we were interested in this question that macrophages, which are actually glycolytic cells and very Warburg-like, what happens? How do these cells actually adapt in this situation? If you switch the substrates, these cells are still there when we are calorie restricted. What happens if these macrophages, instead of glucose, have to now deal with ketones, right? Because we, what we know now, that if you actually block glycolysis, at least in T cells, um, that you, know, you can switch the TH17 to Treg lineage. So this is something that is pretty revolutionary in immunology. And the question here is, what would happen, what we can learn from this, and whether this has an impact on, on, redu on reducing 
increasing inflammation, and because we think that these are kind of things that uh, could potentially be important. So I, I don't think you guys need to know this. I, everybody here knows this. Uh, these are these are data. In fact, this is a Yale tale. Uh, George Kehel, who was the guy who really discovered that ketones are really important for brain, uh, along with Hans Krebs, of course. And and the point is that beta hydroxybutyrate is made in the liver. It's an alternative uh, energy source, uh, and it drives the TCA goes into uh, uh, TCA through acetyl uh, acetoacetyl CoA. And the key thing of this of, of this. Uh, uh, of this slide is, is, is this hypothesis that it, it actually functions as a super fuel. So when you don't have a, a sufficient amount of glucose, and there are several reasons for it, and, and, and they're all listed here. I don't have time to go into all of this. But one of the key things here is that, in fact, that you know, uh, there, for the BHB to, uh, to produce these calories, it actually requires only three enzymatic steps. So it reduces the NAD couple, so you get much less ROS. So it is supposedly a much better fuel and is supposed to have, uh, you know, supposedly better effect. So what we did was to understand how it potentially regulates the inflammasome. And, and here is the structure of beta-hydroxybutyrate. Uh, it is very similar to butyrate, which is a short-chain fatty acid, which is made by the microbiota. So if you're starving, one day fasting, about the, the, you can see the levels around this. If you're starving, it can reach up to 10 millimolar. And, and of course, in diabetic keto ketoacidosis, that's a huge problem. So here is an inflammasome activation assay. And what you're looking at, again, is the cleavage of caspase 1 in response to LPS uh, and ATP. And when you provide beta-hydroxybutyrate to these macrophages in this condition, what you get is a dose-dependent inhibition of the inflammasome such that by about 5 millimolar concentration, you can actually totally ablate the NLRP3 inflammasome activation. So this is the caspase 1, and this is the active IL-1 beta. So P17 subunit of IL-1 beta is the one that actually does all the, uh, all the stuff. And the important point, I'm not showing the data, is that butyrate, in fact, has no effect on the NLRP3 inflammasome. So what was also quite interesting was that, that beta-hydroxybutyrate is blocking inflammasome in response to actually diverse damage-associated molecular pattern, which was very surprising and made our task actually much harder in many ways. So here is, again, the same caspase-1 activation assays. Here you're looking at palmitate activation, so palmitate uh, causing the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. It's reduced by the BHB. Uh, this is probably more relevant to, to, to those of you who are interested in, in urid crystals and gout, which was actually discovered here by, uh, by Jörg Chop. And you can see that in, even in a, in a crystal induced inflammasome activation, presence of BHB reduces this, and so does uh, with, with the ceramide. So I will get to the mechanism, but the key point here is, is that you know, there's a lot of talk about this, this could potentially work through this GPR, uh, uh, one of those GPCRs, and so we tested this, uh, and the answer is actually no. It, uh, so BHB does not require GPR109A to elicit its effects on the NLRP3 inflammasome. So these are GPR109A knockout cells, and these are the wild-type cells. And, and this is uh, BHB uh, blocking the inflammasome. It blocks in, in both the situations. Here, butyrate has no effect. And, and of course, BHB comes in a it's an enantiomer, so it also comes in this biologically inactive uh, levo form. So we did this kind of a experiment as a sort of a control experiment that it shouldn't work, right? And so it works fantastically, actually, and which is great in a way because this, this L form has a longer half-life. It doesn't go into TCA. It still binds GPR109A, but the, but the data is pretty clear. It, is, it doesn't, it does, uh, it's very effective. So what's going on? What's the mechanism? It took us about, Five years, we're kind of slow people. And, uh, and <laughs> an answer is mostly negative. So when you elicit adaptive starvation response, you get all these, these phenomena, all, all these mechanisms activated. We all know this, right? There's a reduction in mitochondrial ROS, there's activation of AMPK, reduction in glycolysis, autophagy, lipolysis, blah, 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 right? Each one of them actually controls inflammasome activation. BHB can induce all of them. And then BHB, beta-hydroxybutyrate, is also a class, a class 1 HDAC inhibitor. So it can uh, affect transcription through that mechanism. Uh, it can ligate GPR109A. And of course, my favorite was that it goes into TCA, uh, generates these intermediary metabolites, which can you know, obviously post-translationally modify several proteins and hence uh, regulate the inflammasome. Answer, it turns out, 
is actually very simple. None of these pathways are involved. And the way it really works is through its biophysical effects. So here is the data to show this. So, so like I mentioned, the NLRP3 inflammasome, for it to be assembled, it requires the oligomerization or the prionization of this adapter called as ASC. Okay, this is absolutely critical for this, uh, for this protein to be assembled. And you can study that, and it forms the spec. And you can study them by, by actually looking biochemically into oligomerization of this adapter. And this was the data that was uh, done in collaboration with Imad al namri in Pennsylvania and in, in Philadelphia. And what his lab here, uh, so we sent him this compound and he did this, and what he basically shows is that when you provide beta hydroxybutyrate in the macrophages where we elicit uh, the activation is basically you don't get the oligomerization of this adapter. So what we did was <clears throat> we, uh, we took these... Uh, so, 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 sorry, Risha, can you go back one, one slide? So can you tell us again how the experiment is done? What is the material used? So these are macrophages and these are NP insoluble ASE in the cell pellet. So basically what happens is it, it, gets, it gets oligomerized. And, and you can study the oligomerization by looking into the dimer and the monomer formation. It's like the standard, uh, the classical oligomerization assay. It's not the best way to look into the prionization. For the prionization, you have to look into these, you know, with the new micros with the microscopy to actually quantitate that. But biochemically, this is basically how it is done. And so we wanted to check it in a little bit more detail. So in fact, there are diseases like, uh, you know, uh, several diseases called uh, cryopyranopathies, and they are induced by a gain of function mutation of NLRP3, and this is modeled by Hal Hoffman. So basically, in these, in these mice and in these cells, you can get the activation of NLRP3 in inflammasome uh, uh, without any presence of any dam, so it is constitutively active. So here is basically the data to show that when we complex beta-hydroxybutyrate with nanolipogels, what it does is blocks the oligomerization of this uh, uh, ASC adapter. And when these mice are fed a, a diet which contains 1,3-butane diol ketone uh, esters, because mice don't really become very ketogenic, as, as you guys all know, so you, you require this ketone ester diet. And when you provide this ketone ester diet, feed this ketone ester diet to these animals, these animals, which is actually, they suffer from a very nasty pro-inflammatory uh, disease. Um, and right now, these kids are basically treated by uh, IL-1 inhibitors and IL-1 monoclonal antibodies. But a uh, ketogenic diet, in, at least in animals, is very effective in these. So how is it actually working? So this is, of course, very simplistic, but uh, that's what we think is going on in this case, that, of course, energy metabolism and innate immunity is linked. And during the state of negative energy balance, or perhaps in low-carb diets, what you get is fatty acid oxidation and ketogenesis and ketolysis to go into TCA and the host to survive. That's the main function at that point of time, is to have these energy substrates go to the brain. Uh, but we still have an immune system to, to handle. And what BHB does is it actually dampens the innate immune system, and it dampens, in, dampens the innate, immune, in, in, innate immune system by specifically acting on the NLRP3 inflammasome. It does not block the other inflammasome for reasons we actually still do not understand very fully. But it, and it does so in response to actually very diverse NLRP3 activators. And the way it does it is it blocks the efflux of potassium from the macrophages. So this was discovered by Gabriel Nunes in the University of Michigan, that this is one of the key signals in response to all these diverse dams to cause the activation. And once the potassium is efflux, then you get the oligomerization of this complex, and that's how it is working. And in fact, BHB does not require any of these, uh, these fancy you know, pathways, in fact, which are uh, dysregulated with AIDS. So it does not require autophagy. We tested it with various knockouts, neither mitochondrial uncoupling. It actually does not even require uh, oxidation in the TCA in the macrophages. So that's basically how it works. So I'm almost done. And so that's the point. We, we think it's quite, uh, quite interesting in this case because uh, we think that uh, ketone bodies are perhaps one of the mediators of adaptive starvation response, and that it, uh, it, it signals to, and this signals the state of negative energy balance to innate immune system by deactivating the NLRP3 inflammasome. And we also think that BHB, just like there are regulatory cells in the body, this, we think that BHB is a regulatory metabolite, and that it, it blocks the NLRP3 inflammasome by disrupting the ASC oligomerization and actually does it through its biophysical effect, so which, which we think is actually quite promising in, in potential therapy. And that either ketone metabolite or potential diets uh, could potentially be used, uh, and this is something that we are very interested in, uh, uh, against several of the NLRP3-mediated diseases, so that ne needs
needs to be tested. There is some data from, uh, from, from Richard Veach and Mark Madsen that it could potentially be slightly effective in Alzheimer's. I'll, I'll stop here and acknowledge um, all my colleagues that uh, were responsible for, for helping me out with this work. Uh, my colleagues, my former colleagues in Pennington, uh, calorie work was done uh, in collaboration with Eric Ravison at, 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 at Pennington. And a uh, majority of the data that I showed you has been uh, produced by uh, Ryan Grant, my former postdoc, and Uni Yum, who is a junior faculty at Yale, and, and the rest of the folks in my lab. Thank you. You may miss your bus. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was an extremely interesting talk. We have a question here and one here. This is. Uh, thank you very much. Very exciting. I just wanted to ask really quick. So, getting back to these patients that have lots of amyloid and plaque uh, and neurofibrillary tangles in the brain, but have no Alzheimer's disease or other neurodegenerative disease. So, is it known that they are they have a ketogenic uh, lifestyle or? I don't know. I think that would be something for, for uh, you know, uh, studies where people are actually looking into those patients to look into. I mean, you know, it could not, I mean, ketogenic diets are not very easy to adhere to. All you have to do is eat a little bit of carbs and you're done. So, so I would be really, really surprised that those 80-year-olds are, are, are eating ketogenic diet. But there may be genetic components, like, so for example, what, what, what Rudy was talking about with TREM2, and how TREM2 regulates the, the infiltrating monocyte in, uh, that give rise to microglia, and then regulates IL-1-beta, whereas the yolk sac uh, or, or, or originating microglia, resident microglia, are actually performing a totally different task. So I think these things are not clear yet. And it, we also don't know whether these, these cells are actually producing any of these endogenous regulators that are restraining the inflammasome in this condition and maintaining homeostasis. So, so how does that fit with the, inflama the, infla the inflammatory hypothesis of uh, Franceschi? Oh, well, there you have to ask Franceschi. Yeah. Okay. Very nice uh, talk, uh, Deep uh, Davul Patel from Novartis. Um, Combining this with the last talk, it sounds like uh, amyloid certainly activates the inflammasome, yes. and in certain states, you're seeing IL-1 beta expression. Perhaps that's a good target, I don't know. But the inflammasome also activates IL-18, which Correct. I didn't hear much about. Yes. So what is the balance? Do you need to do inhibit both, or is IL-1 beta enough? Yes, yeah, so I think that's it's a very good point, and we don't have an answer to it, uh, only because the the mice are not old enough yet. So, so we, so you know, these studies we have, uh, unlike Alzheimer's mice, which still are eight nine months, we, we have to age these animals for two two years. So we actually don't know downstream of of, of, of the NLRP3 inflammasome because I showed you the data that IL-1 beta in fact mediates only part of these effects. So part of the other effects could be mediated by IL-18, but IL-18 in this context is actually much more complicated because. Because uh, Mihai Nitea and others have shown that, in fact, IL-18 is potentially homeostatic in this case because it improves insulin sensitivity. So uh, whether IL-18 IL is driving those effects is not clear. And it is also not clear that caspase one it, it actually has multiple substrates. So Maya Sale has, has some data that suggests that it could also cleave certain glycolytic enzymes. So, so I think the question in this from what we think is actually going upstream, not downstream. And uh, so, so I think you've probably seen Luke O'Neill's data with MCC and BHP. So I think we think that going upstream is perhaps maybe a better, better uh, approach in, in this case. Uh, Sam Henderson from Xera. Um, so very nice talk. <clears throat> very much enjoyed it. Um, so you, you said that the effect was specific for both forms of BHB. Did you test acetoacetate? Yes, that acetoacetate effect? Effect? yeah, it has no effect. Okay. Uh, and uh, so, acet so basically, BH so beta hydroxybutyrate has to, to go into acetoacetate and then acetyl CoA, then go into TCA. Acetoacetate has no effect. So, we knocked out uh, um, uh, Scott from the macrophages, which is one of the succinyl CoA transferase, which is critical for ketolysis. And when you knock it out in macrophages, uh, uh, BHB still blocks the inflammasome. There's, however, one major caveat of this experiment. And the major caveat is that those macrophages are still exposed to glucose. And uh, I didn't show you the data, in fact, that in these, in these situations when they have glucose, they, are, they just preferentially use glucose. 
they're just wired to use glucose. So I think those experiments have to be done in vivo in much more, um, you know, uh, regulated conditions. So I think some of this data that I showed you, I think, is is uh, not perfect because a lot of it is in, in is in vitro, and in vivo uh, work is kind of going on right now uh, to see how much of this this activation. Is, uh, is mediated by some of these enzymes that are required. And, and macrophages actually have machinery for these things. So this, these data are published in Nature Medicine. And they have actually machinery for ketolysis. So obviously there is a reason for this. Yes. Yes. And I wonder that for how is it possible that you showed in the hippocampus a huge increase in IR1 beta, and you didn't report that these animals are febrile, and so either you have to measure in the hypothalamus, or you forgot half of the story, and maybe IR10 also goes up, which you didn't measure, and therefore an antipyretic simultaneously coming down. So you secondly, uh -huh. secondly, there is now a good ice inhibitor from that tax, which yes. only for lack of money doesn't continue. So you can use it certainly in sure. your experiments all over, because both IR18 and IR1 maturation depends. Yes. But in medical school, I learned all this core. Your experiments suggest that all should be very hot. Yes, I think. you had an endogenous fiber chain four times half. Yes, just because it's four times up, it doesn't mean it has at the same level as when you have fever. So those, those experiments are not done with mice treated with LPS or mice having infection. So that's a totally different thing. And as no, you no, know, no, this yeah. IR1 has been shown right. by Dinarello. Exactly. That's how Dinarello found it, uh, basically, by its pyrogen activity. Oh, so most of these oh. IL-1 beta, so the IL-1 beta that is present in these animals, uh, uh, I didn't show you the data, is not measurable in circulation. And the IL-1 beta that I'm showing you is present in the hippocampus, but it is relative to present in the old healthy animal. So what you're looking at is you cannot compare that level with an animal that has been induced with TLR4, where you have got to have massive IL-1. And by the way, these animals do not have loss of appetite. Uh, they have no anorexia. So in this case, IL-1-beta is, is not driving the hypothalamic effects that, that Charles Ginarello and you guys have started to uh, the great detail as far as... Uh, uh, um, we can discuss more if you buy me another bottle of wine. I think we have, <laughs> I think we have time for one last question. Call uh, in Tel Aviv. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the more common, uh, most common probably, uh, age-associated uh, diseases which are associated with inflammation is atherosclerosis. Um, so what is the specificity of uh, each of these? And also, at the same time, uh, is uh, multiple sclerosis the same as Alzheimer's disease in terms of the inflammation or other specificities? And I think this is important if you want to target the, this in sure. terms of therapy. Sure. So of course, I mean, MS is, is, uh, is very different from in this case. Uh, and the reason why the MS is listed is because IL-1-beta is a major regulator of the TH17 responses. And if you target IL-1-beta, you get improvement of several of these TH17-associated diseases and animal models. This has been proven. So of course, we are not curing the underlying cause of MS by uh, targeting um, you know, IL-1-beta or TH17 in this case. With regards to athero, in fact, uh, these data have been published uh, by us, uh, not directly in the athero model, but increase of uh, ceramides and free cholesterol that happens in the macrophages with age and with different diets. So Ilya Mechnikov was really right with many of these things, that the action really is in macrophages. So, and then Ike Lutz showed that, that these macrophages uh, in athero models uh, uh, have also cholesterol crystals, which activate the inflammasome and leads to progression of the atherosclerosis. So there are like a lot of things, so uh, in this case, that are happening, not just cholesterol crystals, and not just free cholesterol, but also damage that is, that is happening that macrophages are sensing and getting activated with. And this happens in, in several of these, uh, these diseases, including atherosclerosis. Sclerosis, yes. And I think Cantos trial, like uh, Daval was saying, is potentially going to answer this, uh, this question with, with uh, several of these people that are going to be treated with canacunumab. Some of them are older, and some of them have different BMI. So, so we look forward to those type of data once they come out. Thank you very much.
looking forward to a dinner consisting of lettuce without dressing. <laughs> <laughs> Reducing the calories. Thank you.